what action each board is taking to address uh, those, those issues. So I'm very happy to take that forward and I'll get back to the member in due course. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes questions this afternoon. And we therefore turn to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 12045 in the name of Richard Simpson on Scotland's future. Can I invite members who would wish to speak in this debate to press the request to speak buttons now? And I call on Dr Richard Simpson to speak to and move the motion. 14 minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I am pleased to open this debate on Labour's motion and move the motion in my name. I should, as usual, draw attention of the members to my declarations of interest. Presiding Officer, this is a wide-ranging motion, and indeed the amendments are also wide-ranging, and I hope we will have a constructive debate. It is always inevitable that as opposition parties we need to fulfil our prime duty of holding the government to account, and just as I expect the government mentions will undoubtedly defend their record as usual. However, I hope that we can begin at least by agreeing that the valuable funding provided through the Barnett for formula uh, has proved useful over the years. Labour increased health spend by 100% between 1997 and 2008, the largest increase in, in funding for the health service in 60 years. Of course, decisions as to what to do with the funds provided is wholly a matter for this government. And in that respect, there are a few questions that really should be answered. The Independent Office for National Statistics reported that from 2008 to 2013, it, sh it showed that England increased per capita spend in real terms, while the SNP reduced ours. Admittedly, both were in relatively small numbers, but nevertheless, there was a reduction. But more importantly, expenditure in the northeast of England, which is often used as a comparison site for, England, for Scotland and indeed other, other regions and other countries, showed a greater increase than the rest of England. And I just wonder if the SNP are really comfortable that for the first time in the history of the NHS, Scotland now has fewer GPs per capita than the northeast of England. I want to. Yes, I'd be Cabinet happy to. Give Secretary. I, I just wonder if Richard Simpson would acknowledge the £40 million investment that we announced uh, to boost primary care. And uh, I'm sure that would be something that would be welcomed uh, across this chamber as we take forward those plans. Richard Simpson. Yes, I absolutely welcome it. And I want to acknowledge in, in, in the beginning of my speech that the, since the reopening of our parliament in 1999, Labour, Liberal Democrats and SNP have had common ground in seeking to sustain a public service model for our devolved NHS based on collaboration and cooperation and not competition. And in June, the Conservatives joined us in that, uh, in that principle, uh, which was extremely welcome that we've got cross-party agreement on the principles of the way forward. But, Cabinet Secretary, since 2007, demands on the Scottish NHS have increased. Uh, the elderly numbers over that period have increased from 400,000 to 500,000. And many of these extra 100,000, indeed, of the half million, will have complex morbidity. There's also been new and advanced medical diagnostics, ever more expensive medicines, which require specialist administration, and new treatments. And that is why, quite frankly, the oft-repeated defence of the SNP saying the comparison of staffing levels of Labour in 2007 to 2014 are not only irrelevant but frankly nonsensical. More staff are critical to meet greater demand. Malcolm Chisholm will also address this point. The main two drivers for improvement in patient experience since 2001 have been targets and the patient safety programme and both of these are important and welcome. The target for time from referral to treatment, the target for diagnostics, the target for accident and emergency, targets for cancer diagnosis and treatment, the target for delayed discharges. Each has an output which began from a low base when Labour instituted many of these targets, and it has progressed under both administrations. In many cases, once the initial target was reached, new and more demanding targets were set, and they have transformed the patient experience. But again, the comparison of the target levels Labour achieved by 2007 and what is now being achieved will make good sign bites, I'm sure, and are again oft repeated, but are frankly infantile. The comparisons have to be whether there are year-on-year -year improvements. And until 2012, that was indeed the case under both administrations. The problem is that in many instances, 
Apart from the new targets and calms and psychological treatments, we've been going backwards since 2012. And then there is the absolute... Sorry. Uh, uh, Mary, Mary Scanlon. Scanlon. Uh, at the audit committee this morning, I noticed the target of the number of patients waiting more than 12 weeks for an outpatient appointment has increased by 4,200% in the last four years. Richard Simpson. I think that just re-emphasises the point. And I want to go on to say that the, there is actually a scandal at the, the centre of this target business because... The, 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 you know, I, I don't mind the fact that the targets for accident and emergency have been reduced from 98 to 95%. I think that was quite a sensible move because the 98% really was going to be too demanding. But the scandal of the SNP's Patient Rights Act legal guarantee, which has been breached every month since introduction, and breaches are on a rising trend. Now, having a target is one thing, but having a target which is a legal guarantee is a complete and utter nonsense yeah. if it's not going to be met. Cabinet Secretary Simpson would acknowledge that under Labour, of course, there was no such guarantee. And under the SNP, under the SNP, there are 12 people please. absolutely correct that, the breaches, that have breached the target. Would he, though, commend the health service for the 600,000 patients that have been treated within 12 weeks? 98% performance. Surely the staff deserve credit for that. Dr Simpson. And if... If, Cabinet Secretary, your government had taken our advice and not made it a legal guarantee, but it's... Guarantee. No, it shouldn't be a legal guarantee. And Audit, this is please. An abuse. Could this members speak through the officer. chair, please? Sorry? I'm asking you to address your remarks through the chair, please, not directly to the oh, member. The, pres <laughs> the presiding officer... Presiding officer, the Cabinet Secretary says that, 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 that this is not a problem. I welcome the 600,000 who have been treated. I welcome the fact that 98% have been treated. But if you're going to give a legal guarantee, yeah. a legal guarantee, that is completely different. And this is a law which we said at the time was a nonsense, and it is still a nonsense, and it should be abandoned. It is a bad use of law. As the government amendment says, the most have been treated, but it wasn't us that promoted this. Every breach is not a number, but a person. Every person who has breached, where there's been a breach of this guarantee, their experience is poorer. Now, one other crucial Labour decision was to initiate a move to a largely consultant-led service. But, Cabinet Secretary, am I allowed to say that? Uh, uh, actually, it takes 10 years post-graduation to train a consultant. So the maths are very clear. There has not been a single consultant actually trained and in post under the SNP. They've also all begun under a Labour plan. Now, workforce planning is never easy, but it has to be for the medium to long term. So let's look at what the SNP have done. Under SNP plans announced in 2011, the specialist training grades were to be cut by 40%, and the FY01 and 2 to be cut by 20%, at a time when implementation of the European Working Time Directive was actually going to require more junior and middle grades. The consequences are seen in three ways. The largest number of consultant vacancies that the NHS has ever experienced, now 339, or 6.5%, 20% in some specialties. I think I have to be very brief, Cabinet Cabinet Secretary. Secretary. Well, when you have more posts in the system, inevitably there are more vacancies as those posts are filled. Would Richard Simpson not accept that? Dr Simpson. If if you conduct the right plans and don't cut the number of specialist grades, you get more consultants. You cut the grades. And the other thing that's happening, of course, which is a scandal, is that 60% of the consultants in the last three years were appointed not on the nationally agreed contracts, but on nine sessions clinical to one session other the national contract being 7.5 to 2.5. Now, Nicola Sturgeon chose to ignore this issue in 2012, merely saying that's the national contract and it's up to boards. And when I raised it the other day, the Cabinet Secretary accused me of discouraging consultants coming to Scotland. Cabinet Secretary, it is not me who's discouraging them. It is your failure to order boards to follow the national contracts. Now, this is, at the very least, a matter requiring examination. The Grampian reports, to which I'm sure Graham, Richard Baker will refer, uh, uh, indicates the damage that is done by taking out of things two and a, two and a half sessions of, of the consultants doing audit, research, teaching, personal development, and the crucial service to redesign that we need. This, Cabinet Secretary, is not sustainable. We will not retain these consultants if you insist on them remaining on a 9-1 uh, appointment. 
And as if these decisions on medical staffing wasn't bad enough, the, 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 this government cut the nursing intake by 20%, nursing student intake, against the advice of the Royal College in unison. In 2011, they also allowed the boards to cut 2,400 nursing posts, a level at the time which was six times greater than the cuts in England. This government also cut the midwifery student intake by 45%, closing three midwifery schools with only a few months' notice. And this at a time when the birth rate had increased by 10%, complex births had increased, conditions related... No, I'm sorry, I've taken enough intervention. Conditions related to drugs and alcohol were being increasingly recognised, and there was a UK shortage of midwives. This was a parochial bad decision. Now, I welcome the fact that almost all these decisions have been almost totally reversed in terms of intake. But to reverse something within two years of your work plan being announced is a disgraceful sign of poor planning. And I think John Prentland will illustrate the consequences of this in Lanarkshire. Presiding officer, we've been calling for an independent, robust, integrated monitoring and inspection system, which should now happen with an examination of emergency systems in each board and a more thorough inspection of, of Health Improvement Scotland's uh, uh, programme for the elderly care, the health, the health environment inspectoring, boarding out and delayed discharges. Because as the Cabinet Secretary has just said in an answer to a question this afternoon, it is the integrated whole system of emergency care that needs to be looked at. The problems are across the whole NHS community and hospital. And it's about demand with inadequate preventive measurements or ablement, inadequate diversion to keep people out of hospital, then pressure on A&E partly due to a lack of a whole system approach with NHS, GP out of hours, as again we heard in questions about uh, Cumbernauld today, as well as dis delayed discharges. And Rhoda Grant will talk a little bit more about care in the community in relation to this motion. The problems, presiding officer, have never been seen more clearly than Christmas and the New Year. A&E was swamped. So patients lay on trolleys for up to 24 hours. Some were readmitted, having been just discharged, and then lay on trolleys for 14 hours. Hospitals were close to new admissions. Consultants seriously, and this is, I can validate this, seriously having to be persuaded by medical directors from leaving the next patients and ambulance that arrived at the door. Now, we haven't seen this since 1997. And Cabinet Secretary, we haven't even had the challenge of a bad winter. The level of flu is subnormal at the present time, although I'm told from my advisors this is about to rise. Presiding officer, in 2008, Shona Robson proudly announced that Labour's target of zero delayed discharges in hospital for more than six weeks had been met. But frankly, her hubris led her to say that not only had they achieved this important target, but delayed discharges would now remain at zero. Presiding officer, this was a claim too far. In 23 out of 27 of the subsequently reported quarters, this zero level, promised by the now Cabinet Secretary, has not been achieved. Now, despite this failure, and despite the damaging and unprecedented squeeze on local authority care budgets, Nicola Sturgeon, in her, one of her last acts, set new targets of four weeks maximum delay from April 2013 and two weeks from April 2015. Another extraordinary decision on a, on a system that is under huge pressure, where our staff are serving above and beyond and are now being required to do even more. The critical issue is that when beds are blocked, admissions from any are delayed, resulting in the trolley waits I've described. The number of beds occupied have risen by 25% since 2012, from 30,000 to 42,000, excluding Code 9. And once again, this masks a vast variation. Renfrewshire reporting a rate of only 308 bed-occupied days per 1,000 people for, uh, over 75, compared to Aberdeen City at 2,212. Now, this is another example of variation that needs really proper inspection. So will the Cabinet Secretary invite his and the Care Inspector to examine the reasons for it? Will she commit today to working with local authorities, but in particular Aberdeen and Edinburgh cities, which have the bigger problems? In the remaining 60 seconds, I want to turn to the UK mansion tax. This is an example of risk sharing and benefit sharing. The levy, which will be levied by, by Labour to support NHS, not just in Scotland, but in every area across the United Kingdom, to be paid only by those residences worth over £2 million, only 895 in Scotland. But this is actually about the redistribution of wealth accumulated in London. And I know Boris Johnson objects, but actually we, we all contribute to that wealth. We all contribute to mega-city development, and therefore redistribution from it is entirely appropriate. 
Presiding officer, in conclusion, I said at the beginning, it is the duty of an opposition to be critical. But I do acknowledge that until 2011, progress by this government was being made and it was good progress. And I welcome the government's acknowledge today in their amendment of some of the pressures and challenges reflected in the worsening statistics that are occurring. We share common principles with the government, but we need to resolve the problems before our hard-working staff burn out. I move the motion. Thank you. And I now call on Shona Robinson to speak to and move Amendment 12045.3. Ten minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer, and I'll just move the amendment in my name at the start. Uh, I certainly welcome the opportunity to be able to set out the, the government's priorities. It is absolutely a great honour to be Cabinet Secretary for Health. It comes with a, a great responsibility to both address concerns about NHS performance, but also to praise the achievements that our NHS staff deliver on a daily basis. I want to take this opportunity to thank all of our hardworking staff for their efforts, particularly over the festive season, and of course, when their uh, ongoing work in treating over 2 million patients that the NHS sees every year. I want to begin by addressing some of the, the current issues that have been highlighted uh, within the system. I want to first of all recognise that the NHS has had uh, to cope with significant pressures this winter. As has been said, an ageing population, seasonal flu, increasing demands are features not just of this winter but past winters and staff should be commended for their efforts which has despite those pressures, seen nine out of ten patients seen within four hours in A&E. These are pressures which have affected all parts of the healthcare system across the UK, and we should remember that because all of the main parties in this chamber, of course, in one way or another, are in charge of the NHS somewhere on these islands. So we all face those same issues, and, uh, and we should perhaps bear that in mind when it comes to scrutinising the performance of the NHS here in Scotland. Preparing? Yes, of course. Jenny Mara. The Cabinet Secretary for giving way. Um, like other parts of these islands, will the Cabinet Secretary consider publishing the A&E waiting times on a weekly basis? Cabinet Secretary. As Jenny Mara should know, ISD, which is independent from uh, ourselves, decide when statistics should be published. They consulted in public, as she should know, and came up with the monthly A and E uh, performance publication that will take place from February onwards. Now, if Jenny Mara doesn't think that's correct, then she should take that up with ISD. I think monthly is correct, and that's what will happen. Let me make uh, some progress. Preparing for winter is essential, and there's a huge amount of preparation that has gone on for this winter. So far, as part of our £50 million national unscheduled care plan, we have made £28 million available this year to improve general performance over winter, including tackling delayed discharge. The number of A&E consultants has almost tripled, uh, rising from 75.8 to 207.4. And we've increased the number of intermediate care beds by 200 on top of the 500 that are already within the system. And over the next few weeks, we'll continue to work with the Royal Colleges who have endorsed that plan to make further improvements, because further improvements, I absolutely accept, need to be made. I want to now talk about delayed discharges. And as I said earlier on, delayed discharges are absolutely, and tackling them uh, is my top priority. I want to eradicate delayed discharge from the system. And Richard Simpson is quite right to go back to when we did do that. Of course, the challenges mm -hmm. have been around two systems that don't always work together. That is why we have brought in legislation, the biggest public mm -hmm. sector reform we have seen in years to bring those two systems together. Delayed discharges have no upside. It's the worst outcome for individuals at the highest cost to the system. I am very confident that integration will help to tackle this problem. Parliament is also convinced and has passed the legislation to make this a reality from April. But we haven't waited for integration. We've been taking action now to tackle delayed discharge. My officials have been working closely with seven partnerships, which include Aberdeen and Edinburgh, but others as well, to tackle some of the worst delays within the system. And I am encouraged that this is starting to bear fruit. Yes, some partnerships are investing in a minute. Yes, some partnerships are investing the additional resources in more home care, as we'd want them to, but we're also seeing things like intermediate care being developed, technology solutions being developed. 
more care home uh, places and improved quality and the recruiting and training to retain uh, and motivate our workforce. Yes, Mary Scanlon. Thank you for giving way. Can I just say, we've had health and social care integration in the Highlands for two years now, and yet we have people like Debbie Meehy, who had, was delayed, her discharge was delayed for over 12 months. This is not the only answer. Cabinet Secretary. Well, if Mary Scanlon wants to write to me about that particular patient, I will look into th those circumstances. I'm not saying it's the only answer to Mary Scanlon, but it is a significant shift because, as you, Mary Scanlon will know, having two systems with two different budgets, where sometimes there's a perverse incentive to not move someone out of the system, um, is a difficulty. And by bringing those two systems together, I believe we'll make a, a real step change in tackling this problem. I want to turn to workforce. The NHS is, is a huge organisation employing in excess of 159,000 staff. It offers staff the opportunity to work in a world-class healthcare system that's modern and well equipped. And of course we have a, a good record on staffing and it's one that I am absolutely determined to tell as often as possible because the staffing total is up by 7.6%. But within that, let's look at the number uh, of consultants that uh, Richard Simpson referred to. NHS consultants now at a record high, up 36.8%. A&E consultants, a rise of over 173%, having listened to the Royal Colleges of Emergency Medicine and taken on board uh, what they have said. But let me turn to nurses. The number of qualified nurses is up by more than 1,700 and there are more to come. In this last year alone, the number of nursing and midwifery staff rose by more than 1,000, and board projections indicate a further increase of over 400 nursing and midwifery staff by the end of the current financial year, and a further 500 community nurses coming into post over the next two years. So 1,700 nurses already delivered, 1,000 nurses uh, being delivered. We expect uh, boards to have rigorous recruitment processes in place to ensure that posts are filled appropriately and that we have the correct mix and number of staff to provide safe, effective, effective care. And we're backing that up with significant investment. Only last week, the First Minister announced an extra £2.5 million will be invested in specialist nursing uh, 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 workforce. We've already committed uh, 41.6 million over the next four years to substantially increase the number of community nurses. We will continue to look at ways that we can attract the best talent to NHS Scotland. So this is about real nurses and real posts, not about a general election slogan that is for short-term political expedience. And we need to be clear, as the RCN is, this isn't just about nurse numbers. This is about the whole healthcare system. And looking at the whole Order, healthcare please. system, it's about health and social care integration. So we agree with the RCN uh, on that. Uh, very briefly, <clears throat> Jenny Mara. How much of the £440 million, uh, government underspent has she asked John Swinney for to spend on health? Cabinet Secretary. She needs to be the finance spokesperson for her party. She will know that only £145 million of that could possibly have ever been spent on public services. And it has been put in to public services. If Jenny Mara, seriously, as the previous finance spokesperson, thinks Order, that student loan money could somehow have been transferred into public services, then she really wasn't doing her job in her last portfolio. You need to do your homework on that. Let me, turn, let me turn to money, though, because money is important. Let me turn to money. In the SNP's manifesto in 2011, we guaranteed that the revenue budget of the NHS would be protected in real terms. And I can confirm that the health resource consequentials have been passed on in full each year since 2010, a 4.6% increase since 2010. And that is despite a 6.7% real terms cut in the Scottish Government's resource budget by Westminster over that period of time. And as was announced as part of the 15-16 draft budget by John Swinney in October, in 2015-16 we will in fact exceed this commitment by passing a further £54 million of health resource uh, to the budget. That means the Scottish health budget will top £12 billion for the first time next year by anybody's 
a stretch of the imagination. That is a lot of money. What's important is how that money is spent. And that's why it's important that we set out the clear priorities we expect the, he the health service to deliver for that resource. And of course, it is important we acknowledge that it's treating more people uh, than ever before. I also want to just say a word about waiting times. Now, let me be very clear. Everybody, every patient should receive timely and quality treatment. And it's not acceptable that anyone has asked, had to wait beyond those targets. But let me be very, very clear. This government has set tougher targets than was ever the case before 2007. And the NHS has performed better against those targets than was the case previous to that. And let me give you an example of that. Since the introduction of the treatment time guarantee, over 600,000 patients have been treated within 12 weeks, a 98% performance against that target. And while 12,000 people were not treated within 12 weeks, and I've said that's not acceptable, let me contrast that with the previous situation. In an exchange between Nicola Sturgeon and the former First Minister, Jack McConnell, just at the end of the tenure of Labour being in power, she said, more than 23,000 patients have been waiting for treatment for more than six months, and 12,000 patients have been waiting for more than a year. 12,000 patients waiting for more than a year. So I know that 12,000 patients shouldn't wait for more than 12 weeks, but don't lecture us about your record on waiting time. Daughter, close, please, Cabinet Secretary. Had to wait more than a year for treatment. No, thank you. Dr Simpson, the Cabinet Secretary is closing. I will take no lectures from a party that has such an appalling record on waiting times when in power. But let me be clear, we have a vision and direction for our health service based on quality and sustainability. And our 2020 vision for health and social care has secured significant achievements over the last few years. Let me end on a consensual note, presiding officer. I am more than happy to work with parties across this chamber on taking that vision forward. And I will put out an invitation for, at our meeting at the end of January. I am more than willing to hear good suggestions about how we take the health service forward. But that works both ways. Those have to be proper health suggestions and health policies, not something off the cuff as a general election slogan. And I welcome Cabinet any Secretary, ideas that you really come must forward close, please. from across this chamber. And I look forward to working with parties. And I look forward to the meeting at the end of this month. Thank you. Now calling Jackson Carlaw to speak to and move amendment 12045.2. Six minutes, please. Six minutes. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, this is the first occasion in some short while owing to a family situation that I've been able to participate in a health debate in the Chamber. And while I've welcomed in my own way at the appropriate time the Ministers individually to their portfolios, it's uh, a pleasure this afternoon to be participating in a debate with them together as a team to say that I look forward to challenging them and hopefully to working with them uh, in the period ahead. This afternoon, I think tone is very important. This is the first major health debate of 2015, uh, and it is an issue, of course, which I think is important to the public like no other. Uh, our motion opens and, in a way, reflects the point the Cabinet Secretary herself made. With the Labour Party in charge of health in Wales, with the Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats in charge of health in England, and with the SNP in charge of health in Scotland, there is no part of these aisles which has not found its NHS, not only under enormous seasonal pressure now, but pressure way beyond that with which they have to find a solution. In many respects, comparisons now of the health service in Scotland with the health service in England are invidious, both because of the Blair reforms and the subsequent coalition reforms, the divergence of our health services, both south of the border and here in Scotland since devolution are such that we really have to look and examine our own path, our own strategy and judge what the success of that has been and how it has to be altered in order that we make progress. And that's really why, uh, as Dr Simpson was kind enough to acknowledge uh, some 18 months ago, Scottish Conservatives accepted, I remember there was almost an intake of breath at my use of the word collective as if I had ushered language not known to a Conservative, but that a collective approach based on the principle of a health service free at the point of need and delivery within the public service in Scotland, that acceptance by all political parties was fundamental if we were going to work together to move forward. And I said when I made that commitment 
that that also meant that when the first opportunity came along in the face of adversity or a deteriorating or a crisis position, uh, for opposition spokesmen simply to stand in this chamber and to shout at the government that it was all their fault, their responsibility, and that only if we were in charge all would be different, really was not going to materially add to the debate or the agenda. I could say after 16 years of having nothing to do with the management of the health service in Scotland, and some may rejoice, rejoice at that news in Scotland, Scottish Conservatives could quite happily stand back and say the responsibility lies elsewhere. But it is the responsibility not just of this government, but of this parliament for Scotland's health service, and its destiny is ours. And it is important, therefore, that we work together to achieve an objective and a strategy which is going to be successful. Now, I have concerns uh, at the Labour motion. Actually, uh, in many respects, I thought uh, Dr Simpson made some telling points, and it would be unfair not to acknowledge that some of the barbs did strike home, and I don't think we can simply dismiss all of these points as simply nothing more than Labour rhetoric. But I am concerned, partly by the tone of the motion, if not the way it was introduced, that there is, with the new Labour leadership in Scotland, something of a Westminsterisation of our agenda. Uh, and whereas Mr Murphy's ultimate boss wishes to weaponise the NHS in England as an electoral tool, I very much hope, but suspect it will be unavoidable, that there will be an appetite, if not a temptation, to allow the next few months to be dominated by the weaponisation of the Scottish NHS purely for electoral purposes. And that, I have to say, comes on the back of a lot of agreement about the way that we might move forward, being slightly undermined by the previous Health Secretary, who a month before the referendum sought to politicise the health service in a way that we hadn't previously seen. So we now are in an environment, I'm afraid, where that tactic has become preeminent, and I very much regret it and hope that we can roll back from it. Because people like Malcolm Chisholm, people like Hugh Henry, people like Duncan McNeill have all recognised uh, the way in which we have to move forward if we're going to be successful. Now, our, our motion makes mention of the money. The Cabinet Secretary has referred to the full passing on of the consequentials, and I refer back to the answer Alec Neil gave a year ago almost to the day in which he set that out. But what it also reveals is that it is just the consequentials being passed on that have been the monies upon which the health service in Scotland have had to rely. Without those additional consequentials, the actual core budget of health in Scotland would have been frozen, whereas in England that budget has also increased as well as the consequential spending. So in net terms, one could argue that there has been greater funding elsewhere in the United Kingdom than here in Scotland, and that is a concern. But in itself, it really is not a response to the measure of the situation. Now, I will be summing up too and want to come back to points made by the RCN last week, which I think the Cabinet Secretary touched on as well. But I want to say this to the Cabinet Secretary. She is the third Cabinet Secretary with responsibility for health in this Parliament. The first, now the First Minister, was a very effective crisis manager. I found her slightly Stalinist in her approach. I would characterise it by saying I think, frankly, she lacked a certain amount of imagination in terms of responding to the wider dynamic that we have to face over the next 20 years to get health right. I found Alec Neil a bit more of an LBJ, if I can characterise him in that way. I think he's a bit of a fixer, a man who likes to find accommodations and solutions to problems, still certainly centre-left in his dynamic. But I think he was working with other parties before we had that interruption of the referendum and the rhetoric that spurted forth at that point to seek to find a collective strategy with which we can all support. The question is, where does the Cabinet Secretary now see herself in this equation. She is one half of the imperial second family of the SNP uh, that now is responsible, and she has to define where she will go. Our motion calls for an early debate on that, and I'm delighted to see that, in fact, next week we will have that, and that she wishes to, uh, to pursue the cross-party meetings that we had seen embarked upon. Well, I hope in her summing up, she will define very carefully how she works, hopes to work, and whether she believes she has the bread, the vision and imagination to arrive at a consensus around which the whole of this parliament can unite. Only if it can do I fear we will respond successfully to the many well-documented chal challenges we have detailed in recent months. Thank you. We now turn to the open debate. I'm afraid that we have no time in hand and intervention, so therefore within your own six minutes. Linda Fabiani to be followed by Malcolm Chisholm. Thank you, Presiding Officer. That was unexpectedly quick. 
Um, can I say, presiding officer, when I first saw the title of the Labour debate, Scotland's Future, I was actually quite pleased and, and decided I'd like to take part because I really thought, oh, here we go, a bit of a shift in thinking. We're going to move on from negativity to genuinely looking at our nation's future. Perhaps a recognition that for the benefit of Scotland and everyone within it, we should be looking to Westminster and discussions on the Smith Commission proposals with a view to try to get something that is indeed coherent and really works to the benefit of us all. So it was with great disappointment that I actually saw the Labour motion, uh, not in that it was about health, but in that it was, here we are again, let's just have a go at everything we possibly can because it's the SNP, it's in government, and we don't like it. Because that's certainly how it seems. Yes, there are concerns in the National Health Service, but uh, I thought I would like to um, read out a quote here. A quote that says, we have come a long way. A decade ago, many of us who are sitting around the table were inundated with cases involving people who could not get an operation. They have disappeared in my caseload, touch wood, so there have been tremendous gains. Now, that quote is from the Health Committee on the 4th of November 2014, and it was by Labour MSP Duncan McNeill, who, perhaps alone amongst his colleague, is recognising, in fact, that since the SNP came into government, minority government in 2007, uh, majority government since 2011, we have made things better within the NHS. Because, like me, he remembers the first eight years when it was Labour and Lib Dems in charge. Our Cabinet Secretary uh, just read out some of that stuff. We heard a lot of talk today about targets. I remember targets being set... Uh, Loads and loads and loads of targets uh, being set by uh, Labour in health. And in fact, I remember when they weren't meeting any of them, they all disappeared. And we didn't have targets anymore. Yeah. And it was just a case of, well, this is showing us up. So we're not going to have them anymore. Written off completely. No, thank you. Um, and, you know, I'll tell you what, that's the difference between Labour in government in Scotland and the SNP in government in Scotland. We know things are hard. We know things have to get better. We know that it can be long term before you can really, really make these differences. And it would be all too easy just to walk away and say, no, we're not doing this anymore. But that's not what we're about. We're about making Scotland better. We're about making life better for our citizens and we're about shaping a better health service. All you have to do is look at the wording that is used. If you look at the Labour motion, it's, oh, woe is me, delayed discharge targets are not being met. Let's get that into perspective. In October 2014, there were 321 patients delayed from being discharged for over four weeks. In October 2006, under Labour, the figure was 908 patients. Things are getting better. But the honesty of the Cabinet Secretary for Health in this government is shown in her amendment, where she acknowledges that further steps are required to reduce delays in discharge. It's not about running away from responsibilities, it's about facing up to them. And that's why you have, just now, the discussion going on, the moves going on, the decisions being made about delayed discharge being a top priority and about linking that in, because it's all about linking in with greater joint working between health and social care services. Additional funding um, having been given to do that. That's difficult because we have entrenched attitudes in our public institutions, whether it be local authorities through social work and indeed the health boards. It is difficult, but the commitment has been made to move that forward. I think we're doing good stuff. I think the SNP have really grasped this and moved on with the recognition that it's not perfect and a lot more still has to be done. A couple of things I'd like to raise, presiding officer, just before I close, because I know you're short of time. The Labour motion, the NHS in Scotland is under extreme pressure. Yes, it is under extreme pressure, but I'll tell you one of the most extremes is the amount of the NHS budget that's spent in paying off Labour's blooming PFI debts. Yeah, yeah. Final minute. NHS Lanarkshire will spend around one and a half billion 
one and a half billion paying off a capital investment of 127 million. That's what Labour did for our health service. And then we have this talk about the extra nurses funded by the mansion tax. Now, I don't have time to get into the bad accounting that has gone behind that proposal. But what I will say, money raised by the mansion tax will be absolute peanuts compared to the austerity measures that Labour walked through the lobbies with the Tories and voted yeah, for yesterday. Yeah. Thousands and millions of pounds of austerity cuts. Perhaps that's where they should be looking. And if we are talking about Scotland's future, I'll close, presiding officer, by saying it's very, very clear to me through the NHS and other things that Scotland's future is best served by the SNP. Thank you, Malcolm Chisholm. To be followed by Stuart McMillan. Uh, presiding officer, the Cabinet Secretary's speech to some extent and Linda Fabiana's uh, speech to a greater extent uh, illustrated the main uh, uh, response that the SNP give whenever, give whenever they are challenged on the NHS, and that is they compare what's happening now with what happened under the Labour Liberal administration. Now, I'd like to make two points about that. Firstly, we expect continuous improvement from the base that you inherit. And the reality is the SNP inherited a good base in 2007 and, have, as their own amendment emphasises, have had £2.7 billion... In a, moment, in a minute, in a minute, let me make my point. £2.7 billion extra to spend. So we would expect continuous progress. But the second point I'd make, completely contrary to what Linda Fabiana said, is that there was continuous improvement from the base Labour inherited, waiting times of 18 months and a lot more in many cases, uh, over the years that we were in uh, government. And if I can just give one example uh, of that, looking at the subject of delayed discharges and reading the Audit Scotland report of 2005 from autumn 2000 to the end of 2004, which just happens to be uh, the years when I was hanging around the health department, there was a 40% drop in delayed discharges. Now, from July 2012 to September 2014, the number of bed days occupied by delayed discharge patients has increased by 30% from 95,000 to 124,000. We expect continuous progress. We had continuous progress under Labour and Liberal Democrats. That is now going into reverse. That is the basis of our concerns. And it leads to, for example, 15% uh, of beds in Lothian being uh, occupied by delayed uh, discharge figures. I think that's slightly higher than the 9% Scottish figure. And that, plus the extreme financial difficulties of NHS Lothian, uh, mean that we are extremely concerned that we've only got £4 million out of the £65 million. And if the Health Secretary wants to uh, uh, intervene, as she indicated, perhaps she would comment on that as well. Cabinet Secretary. Can I say we absolutely work with Lothian and, and particularly Edinburgh City Council to address these matters. But would Malcolm Chisholm acknowledge that the targets we have set have been tougher than the targets that were previously set and the NHS has performed better against them. I agree we need to see continuous improvement but surely being the, the generous individual he is he would acknowledge that they're actually much tougher than when he was in charge of the health department. Malcolm Chisholm. I've, I've over the last seven years I've been happy to acknowledge progress when there has been some but the basis of concern now has been that it's gone into reverse and uh, moving on to A&E which is another uh, concern in the uh, in the motion, and this is not to do with tougher targets. Um, the progress, this is the Audit Scotland report most recently, 2013-14. Uh, the progress uh, in E&E since 2008-09 has uh, gone into reverse. The number of people delayed in E&E &E while waiting for a hospital bed since 2008-09 has increased fourfold. So I think we just have to register these uh, trends moving in the wrong directions and are concerned about them. Now, if we look at a &E, the answer to these things, obviously, finance is important, and we should also remember what the R RCN said. I have to quote this. It is time to stop thinking of A&E and, indeed, hospital care in isolation from the rest of the health and social care system. But for the purpose of the debate, let's look at A&E and delayed discharges. And I, was, I really think everybody should look at the front page of the Herald from Friday the 9th of January. And this is not to do with money. This is uh, Professor Derek Bell, the number one UK expert on emergency care, who established the Emergency Care Collaborative in England, which I visited before it was set up in Scotland. 
Scotland, and he said that waiting times in A and E uh, were better five years ago when the programmes of the Emergency Care Collaborative were in operation. Why not bring them back? He said the recent surge was predictable. Uh, uh, we need to develop a far more robust and reliable plans that engage and support the workforce. Uh, uh, and that we should listen to experts like that. That's not a matter of money. That's a matter of organisation. Now, moving on to delayed discharge, clearly the level of community infrastructure is fundamental and the amount of money going into social care. But there are also issues of leadership and learning and micromanagement. And we can learn a lot, not just from the expert group report on delayed discharge from 2012, but also from the 2000 and to action plan, uh, which again had suggestions such as learning networks and ring fence money. And I was pleased, I have to say, that at the start of the 2012 uh, expert group report in the very first paragraph, they quoted something I said at the launch of the 2002 action plan. But enough of that, because I do want to spend the last minute on nursing. And I'm sorry I've not had time for an intervention, but we do need to cover all of the three elements that are mentioned in the motion. And I think that uh, Labour's uh, announcement about 1,000 nurses should be well Welcome by everybody in this chamber and the whole of Scotland, because we all know that nurses are at the heart of the NHS workforce. And as I emphasised on my members' debate uh, on nursing last week, it's not just traditional roles, but they are the vanguard when it comes to innovative roles, compassionate care in the community, addressing health inequalities. And I do hope that the, the government will not only uh, follow the Labour lead in terms of committing to extra nurses, but also support the RCN campaign in terms of a, a consistent long-term funding for the kind of posts that were highlighted in the RCN's Nursing Edge at the Edge Initiative. Uh, nurses working against health disadvantage in the community and their call for the health and social care partnerships, which are starting very soon, uh, to pr prioritise that kind of work. Clearly, a lot of the, the, the solution to these problems comes Yes, uh, through integration, but actually through the development of new kinds of services in the communi uh, community by these integration authorities. So I, I hope uh, the, RCN, uh, the, the government will follow the RCM's advice on nursing and Labour's advice on all of these matters. Many thanks. Stuart McMillan to be followed by Richard Baker. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, today's debate uh, does come at an important time uh, for, the, for Scotland's NHS and also the, the debate is also entitled Scotland's Future. Uh, now, I think there was a report uh, uh, published by Audit Scotland in October uh, 2014, uh, and paragraph uh, 58 uh, of that report, I think, actually highlights uh, this particular debate and, and the situation of the NHS going forward. And I'm going to quote this paragraph. It states, longer-term forecasts to 2018-19 by the, by the OBR show a real-term reduction in total UK public sector expenditure of 0.7% in both 2016-17 and 2017-18, before levels are maintained in 2018-19. Such reductions in spending at a UK level will affect the level of funding available in Scotland, and the Scottish Government will need to plan for health spending within an overall reducing budget. The pressures on public spending and NHS are well known and explained in this report, and certainly this report is something that we discussed this morning within the Public Audit Committee. Yet, last night, uh, we saw Labour MPs from Scotland walk hand in hand with the Tories to impose more austerity cuts on the public sector, as well as, as introducing further tax rises. These austerity cuts, promoted by the Coalition Government and backed by Labour MPs, uh, particularly Scottish Labour MPs, will see more cuts to Scotland's budget and more pressure put not just upon our NHS, but on all of our public services. If the Labour Party members opposite are so concerned about Scotland's NHS, and I genuinely believe that many of them are, and then maybe they should have been lobbying their own MPs to stop them from backing Tory cuts to Scotland. The continuation of the austerity policies of the UK parties will put greater pressure on all of the public services in Scotland, including our NHS. While well, Labour refused to match the SNP's commitment to protect the NHS budget, this Scottish Government has managed to increase it, uh, with the health resources budget rising to a record £12 billion in 2015-16, an increase of just under £3 billion, a 32.4% increase under the, the SNP. However, the Scottish Government can only do so much to protect Scotland's NHS, whilst Labour team up with the Tories to slash public spending. Instead of supporting the NHS. Labour put up another motion in the long line of attacks on Scotland's NHS. And I wonder 
And I actually wonder if it actually has been inspired uh, by the appointment of a new aide to the leader of the Labour Party in Scotland, uh, when they stated that, uh, that the NHS needs the savings that privatisation creates. Of course, Labour have previous in privatisation of Scotland's NHS, uh, but uh, they, outs they outsource cleaning services to private companies and the, the burden to NHS with the PFI debts that, that we've already heard this morning, this afternoon. It took an SNP Scottish Government to bring Strathcarthro Hospital back into NHS and stop the privatisation of cleaning contracts. Whatever the funding levels, uh, I'm sorry, we only have six minutes, I will try and let you in. Whatever the funding levels, uh, there always will be pressures on the NHS. And that was a point that was stated this morning in the Public Audit Committee. Uh, there always will be pressures upon it. I will try and let you in later on, Mr. but not at the moment, uh, uh, Dr. Simpson. Not least because of the demographic changes. Uh, demographic changes. For instance, between 2012 and, 20, and 2037, the percentage of the population aged 65 or over is projected to increase from 17% to 25%. The percentage of the population aged 75 or over is projected to increase from 8% to 13%, and the number of people aged 100 years or older is projected to increase by a mass of 879%. However, as opposed, as opposed to Labour's attacks on the NHS, the Scottish Government have been working with health boards and other public bodies to look at options to improve the services. For example, there is a move to ensure greater joint working between health and social care services. Uh, additional funding of £173 million has been provided in 2015-16 to support this transformation. This has included a work between the NHS and local government to reshape care for older people to ensure a quicker discharge from hospital or to, in, to even find alternatives to hospital treatment where this is appropriate. Under joint working arrangements, NHS boards and councils are combining their budgets for adult social care, adult primary health care and aspects of adult secondary health care. This provides a good opportunity for NHS boards with their council partners to redirect resources and move towards more community-based and preventative care. As opposed to Labour's claims about the staffing levels in Scotland's NHS, the real figures actually show that the number of frontline NHS staff has actually increased under the SNP to record levels. I mean, overall, NHS staffing is up 7.6%, an increase of just under 9,700. NHS consultant numbers are at record level, with an increase of 36.8%. Well, that's, that's over 1,300 more. And the number of qualified nurses and midwives is at a record high of up 4.2%, or just, under, just over 1,700. There is much to be proud of in Scotland's NHS. Um, that's something I'm sure that we can all agree on. Uh, but despite Labour's manipulation of the figures, waiting time targets are improving. Over 600,000 patients, or 98% of all NHS patients, have been treated within the 12-week waiting time guarantee since it was introduced in 2012. To order, Richard Simpson. Is it appropriate for a member to accuse other members of manipulation? Um, it, it, the, the words are for the member who is making his speech. Uh, it's not a point of order, but your point has been made. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, <clears throat> certainly, it's, uh, we'll go back to the point. Certainly, over 600,000 patients, or 98% of all NHS patients, have been treated within 12 week waiting time guarantee since it was introduced in 2012. Uh, Presiding Officer, there is much more I can say, but time certainly is, is against me. In summary, Scotland's NHS is doing a good job. It's not perfect, it can improve, and it certainly must always strive to improve. But uh, it's with the continuing alliance of Labour and the Tories over the austerity cuts, we will see more pressures placed upon our NHS and also all of Scotland's public services. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I now call on Richard Baker to be followed by Christian Allard. Very tight for time, up to six minutes, please, Mr Baker. Thank you, President Officer. I'm pleased that Scottish Labour has given uh, this Parliament the chance to debate health services today because while there are indeed concerns across Scotland over the ability of our health services to meet patient needs, this has been particularly the case for NHS uh, Grampian, as Dr Simpson referred to earlier. Uh, and this was, of course, reflected in comments at the annual review of the board, which I attended on Tuesday. And while the interim Chief Executive, Malcolm Wright, was quite correct in apologising on behalf of the board for the failures identified in the Health Improvement Scotland report on NHS Grampian, the, the fact of the matter is that ministers also must realise they have simply not done enough to enable our local board to meet the specific challenges it faces. That support must now be forthcoming to the new leadership team 
if we are uh, to move forward, as the Cabinet Secretary has said she wishes to do. Now, I'd like to welcome the appointment of Malcolm Wright and the new chair of the board, Steve, Lo Steve Logan, and I'm sure his experience at Aberdeen University will be invaluable in moving NHS Grampian forward, but they will require more support than was received by the former Chief Executive, Richard Carey, and indeed the former chair, Bill Howitson, because as some 20 consultants themselves said, in a letter to the board just over a year ago, underfunding of NHS Grampian has been a key factor in services reaching what they described as a critical situation then. And since then, as Dr Simpson pointed out, we've had three critical reports of services at NHS Grampian. Briefly to John Mason. Is John Mason. the member arguing that Grampian uh, NHS gets more money at the expense of other NHS boards or at the expense of, say, the college sector or some other sector? Indeed, the, the uh, underfunding of NHS Grampian specifically has been recognised across uh, the board. And I want to come specifically to the issues around this as my speech develops, because under the government's own formula, NHS Grampian has been underfunded by £158 million over five years, and more than 400 nursing posts have been cut over three years. The impact of this is clear. NHS Grampian continues to be the worst performer in Scotland against the 62-day referral to treatment waiting target. According to the latest statistics, A&E waiting times against the four-hour standard are going backwards. I'd like to point out to Stuart McMillan that more than £7 million has been spent on sending NHS Grampian patients to private hospitals over the past two years. NHS Grampian spent £6.6 .6 million on agency locums in the last year, more than NHS Lothian, which has a greater population. In August, it spent more than £2,000 bringing a consultant from India to cover a weekend shift, an accident, an emergency. The board has spent £4 million on temporary cover since June last year. So a cash-trapped board is having to spend millions on temporary staff, and that is why the issue of recruitment is so important. It's vital to patients because so many of the problems I've detailed are caused by the recruitment crisis in NHS Grampian, if I have time later on to Mr Stewart. And it's vital for the staff who are working at NHS Grampian today. It's only due to their amazing efforts that we still have a safe service and that so many patients do still receive excellent treatment. But that situation I've described isn't fair to them because NHS Grampian has received hundreds of complaints from its own workers about staff shortages. On 625 occasions in a space of just 12 months, it's the staff members themselves who brought forward complaints about staffing levels, and that simply wasn't happening uh, in previous years. At the annual review meeting, I suggested to the Cabinet Secretary that more serious consideration needs to be given by ministers to an Aberdeen waiting and salaries to aid recruitment in our health service. The Cabinet Secretary has acknowledged that the high cost of living locally is an important factor in making it more difficult to recruit. And while, and, 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 and indeed, she wants to, I think, make an intervention. Sure, Robertson. I was just wondering, given we're four minutes into Richard Baker's speech, at some point will he welcome the accelerated NRAC monies that are going to NHS Grampian next year? In total, 49.1 up, 1 million uplift next year, the highest yep. of any mainland board. You know, I'll, welcome I'll welcome that? any additional funding for NHS Grampian uh, as an improvement, but it's got to be put against a backdrop of years of underfunding uh, by this SNP government. Uh, now, I've been talking about the cost of living issues in terms of affecting uh, recruitment, and the Scottish Government's uh, talked about plans on affordable housing uh, locally, and that is uh, welcome in terms of some of the specific uh, schemes, but it, it will not provide all the answers, and indeed is a longer-term solution when these recruitment issues are with us and now, leaving it to the Health Board alone to create incentives for recruitment and retention simply means that once again it will be a case of further pressure on a local NHS budget, which, even with the changes finally outlined by the Cabinet Secretary, will receive millions less than other boards. And that's why the Scottish Government must provide additional support, as has long been provided to public sector staff in London who face similar cost of living issues. John Sweeney said he would give us serious consideration last May, it's now time for action from ministers. Uh, the Scottish Government has said that the problems outlined in the Health Improvement Scotland report uh, will be addressed. It's imperative that this is now 
what happens. Uh, ministers changed an approach George which saw Oz, a fairer funding formula agreed for NHS Grampian by Labour when we were in a Scottish executive, not being implemented for eight years of this government. For the sake of patients in Grampian and our hard-working NHS staff, it's vital that our new chief executive and chairman achieve the improvements in local NHS services they have said they are determined to bring about. I'm confident that they have the ability to do that in themselves, but it will require a great level of support from the Scottish Government for our local health services they may have seen from ministers over the past eight years. Thanks very much. Now I call on Christian Allard to be followed by Jim Hume. Thank you, President Your Officer. Uh, I would love to say, first of all, to Richard Baker, but I was at that meeting. You might remember I was only two seats away from him. I, I didn't recollect him coming out and sharing all those problems. Yeah, if, if you let me finish my point. Uh, sharing all those problems with the cabinet secretary, who was there, with NHS Grampian, who was there, and with the public. There were, there were a packed public audience there, and it was a very positive meeting. And I don't remember Richard Baker disturbing that positiveness that we got at that meeting on that particular day. What happened since? Uh, uh, Monday, but, but I, sh I changed the attitude of the member. Richard Baker. You know, the focus of my speech was on the particular issue of the recruitment crisis. That was exactly the issue I raised with the Cabinet Secretary and in terms of the incentives for, to recruit staff to the area and indeed a, a further issue over GP recruitment as well. Fair enough, and, and I heard that you received a very positive answer, and we'll speak about it d d during my contribution. I was surprised as well, just like Linda Fabiani, who spoke uh, previously, about the motion which was t t tabled this week. And, and to a certain extent, I was surprised again when Richard Simpson uh, uh, contributed to this, uh, uh, to, 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 to this debate and, and opening the debate. Uh, in a totally different tone that the motion was. So I don't know what I'm going to say today. Am I going to talk about the motion? No, I'm going to talk about what uh, uh, Richard Simpson said. It's, it's, it's quite confusing, it seems to me, that, that the, you know, the Labour members present wants to talk about something about the NHS, and maybe the motion wants to say something else. I wonder sometimes if it's something about what uh, Jackson Carlo said early on. Uh, we heard this week, and Mr. Milliband had said that he wanted to weaponize the NHS. Uh, I have to say that under an SNP government, uh, yes, if you want, yes. Hume. You talked about uh, a party want to weaponise the NHS, but does, do you not recognise that the Yes Scotland campaign weaponised the uh, NHS by their NHS for Yes? I'm sorry, I've got only six minutes. We're not going to uh, we're going to get debate again the referendum debate. Yeah, I leave that to you in your six minutes to talk about the referendum debate. But the picture the Labour Party uh, is desperate to paint to paint since the beginning of the year in this chamber is not based on facts. You would think that there is an election looming like like some people said earlier. This is a desperate attempt to run the same Labour campaign against the NHS across the UK in Scotland. Today the Labour Party has been found out. It won't work. Let's look at the performance over the Christmas period of accident and emergency departments across the country. The four-hour accident emergency performance in Scotland was 88.8% during the period of high pressure. Why in England it was 82.8%, 6% down, President Officer, in the same difficult circumstances. So we have to understand that it's not only about the past, it's about what's happening today across these islands, it's how to judge different governments, how they re react to the problem that we have, the challenges that we have. And I think we perform very well. I have to say, and Cabinet Secretary was there on Monday uh, in Aberdeen, NHS Grampian performance was even higher than the Scottish average during Christmas and New Year. It was a 90.6%. This is why this week, as a health secretary came, I think it was to thank the NHS staff for their hard work under pressure. The NHS Scotland is not a political football for Labour to play with. It is delivering under this government. Our accident and emergency are performing better than in the rest of the UK, and we're not getting away from it. We heard last week that the First Minister was at Ninth Wales Hospitals in Dundee, announcing money for additional nurses in our National Health Service. This week, Scotland Health Cabinet Secretary was in Aberdeen announcing extra funding for NHS Grampian. The new board is now receiving a 49.1 million increase to its budget for next year, despite what uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Richard Baker said. This uh, underfunding was 
introduced under a Labour government. And what this government is doing is reducing it to stopping it in a few years' time and accelerating again this week. So it's very, very important to recognise this. Uh, the SNP government is showing commitment to deliver for the North East. NHS Grampian funding is now with 1% parity with other NHS board around Scotland, one year ahead of, of scheduled presenting officer. So it is very important to recognise all this, that what has been done at Grampian level and at uh, a, a Scottish level. The number of frontline NHS staff has increased under the SNP to record levels. In Grampian, we have 100 more new nurses post in 2013, 100 new last year, but the board wants another 40 this year, another 40 new posts that will be funded with this increase coming from the Scottish Government. And they, the, the will of the board is to increase the number of permanent staff along with a decrease of number of back staff. And that has to be welcome as well because it's very important. And these staffing are coming from abroad who are coming from students, students who are studying at RGU and there is a problem of housing. And I know your predecessor uh, met with uh, NHS Grampian about it. And one solution you draw has to been close, found. Uh, the, the, the site as a prison of conditions will now be available uh, for affordable houses for uh, public health sector. So it, we have making fantastic progress and I, I, I will have the opportunity next week to talk about the future of, of, of the NHS. Unfortunately today, uh, uh, despite uh, the, the, the title of, of the motion, we, we can't talk about the future of the NHS. Uh, I, I think it's very important to conclude, uh, Presiding Officer, uh, in this debate, yes. but the reason why this government has public support, it is because this government has a vision for our nation's public services, protecting funding for the NHS stopping privatisation and recruiting more nurses. Presiding officer. Thanks very much. Now call on Jim Hume to be followed by Mark MacDonald. Up to six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to discuss the NHS again. Uh, clearly, it would be better if we were not discussing a, a crisis, but I think uh, that's what we're facing. The Labour motion sets out well the pressure points within our health service, A&D wait waiting times, people waiting on trolleys for hours on end because of lack of beds, waiting times missed, and we'll be supporting the Labour motion uh, today, if unamended. Of, uh, on that point, yeah. If the member would reflect the points made by Jackson Carlaw in his opening statement that all of the main parties, including your party, has responsibility for delivery of the health service across these islands. I don't think people in glass houses should necessarily throw bricks. It's never wise. No, um, uh, I'll, I'll go on to say how much I want to work with this party, and I'm quite uh, well aware that it's all our responsibilities, but it is our duties as members of opposition to hold the government to account, and that's what we'll, of course, do. It's nothing personal. Uh, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I, I would like to say our NHS is a, an institution that's absolutely greatly valued, so I'd like to put on record again my thanks and respect uh, on that of my Liberal Democrat colleagues for the vital contribution that those working across the NHS uh, make. But as Liam MacArthur suggested in, in, in the debate, uh, we need to uh, no persuading that making that contribution has been more difficult in recent times with the need to rebalance the country's finance, and, and we do recognise that. We all do want a, a, an NHS with a strong, but we need a credible economic uh, plan behind that so that we can ensure that we can uh, fund it, of course. Uh, the government's amendment today uh, does note the challenges but doesn't pay enough attention, in, in my view, to the real con concerns which are being raised, and, uh, raised, and, and that is a wee bit disappointing. Um, we can't really ignore warning signs. The serious concerns are now being raised, not just by MSPs across parties in this chamber, but also by the bodies representing our healthcare workers. Uh, on the 7th of January, the Royal College of Nursing Scotland's senior officer said many nursing staff working in, the, in Glasgow have been in contact with them to let, us, to let them know how worried they are and concerned about how they can care for patients safely when there's so few staff and equipment is in such short supply. So it's clear we have issues to address within our NHS, uh, and it is clear it is not now just seasonal pressure on departments such as A&E, but it's now throughout the year. Uh, we have an increase in demand directly, I think, correlating to an increase in the age demographic, uh, demographic of the country. So uh, I'm afraid the baby boomers have now, uh, of the 50s and 60s, have now got old. 
So there's no doubt there are uh, bed shortages. I'm all for health integration and social care and care in people's homes as much as possible and whenever possible. But it's difficult to, to see how that can be done when we have the situation of fewer district nurses combined with an extra demand across the NHS to also providing health care in the community and district nurses also expected to be children's names persons and the reduction in those district nurses numbers. So I, b I believe there is a mismatch. That's what, what we need, I think, is a long-term workforce plan for across the NHS. And I will say, and I repeat it now, that I'm happy to work with any party and, of course, the new ministerial team and stakeholders to look at how we can do that. And I hope that we can have that on the agenda for the health spokespersons meeting uh, with the Cabinet Secretary later this month. Uh, and she's referred to that already. Um, uh, just to further uh, beef up the points regarding others' concerns, on the 11th of January, the RCN Director, Theresa Fife, warned that the cycle of a &E's struggling to cope, delayed discharges, too few staff, pressure on waiting times, delayed operations and so on will continue unless there is real action to address the pressures. And I know the First Minister is keen to talk about consensus and on this it is absolutely essential that we reach it. So I agree with the Cabinet Secretary's uh, initial uh, intervention that she made with me. With that in mind, I do not want to wish to spend the remainder of the time reading out a list of areas where targets have been missed. Uh, and, and uh, of course, there's life-saving cancer treatments to vital mental health services for young people, which I think need uh, improvement. But, and, of course, the patients having their rights breached, which was mentioned by Richard Simpson. I met the Went Mental Welfare Commissioner, Commission about two weeks ago, the Royal College of Nurses yesterday, and meeting with the Royal College of GPs tomorrow. I want to share some of their concerns raised with me in the meetings to date. The crisis we are seeing is not seasonal. The older generation is already having that an impact. There are simply more people with more complex health needs. There is a continual increase in the use of agency staff. Vacancy rates are going up. More nurses are being trained, but there is a time lag between training and having nurses uh, sufficiently experienced to act independently. Staff are under such time pressures that they do not have time to update their date X systems, as they call it. There is real concern about the integration of health and social care. Delays are caused by a lack of appropriate community support. Primary health services need to be improved, and mental health services are an, under enormous strain with demand continually outstripping to supply. Close, GPs are not referring to psychological therapies because the, the waiting times are so long, and I echo my call for parity in law between physical and mental ill health. In concluding, I hope the Minister will set out uh, actions in these areas. The Ministers must uh, listen to constructive criticism, not simply play lip service to it. The Government must ensure that the health service moves in the same direction, that health and social care integration uh, is successful and we have the workforce we need with the necessary skills now and into the future. I think it is now time to have a workforce Watch strategy close, that will future-proof us uh, well into that future. Thank you. Thanks so much. Now call on Mark MacDonald to be followed by Rhoda Grant. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. It's probably not reciprocal, but I genuinely have a lot of time for Dr Simpson when it comes to discussions around health-related issues. Uh, we spent time together on the Health and Sport Committee, and I think um, when he was making his remarks at the beginning of the debate, I felt that uh, large sections of his speech I felt were very constructive in their approach. Uh, there were elements which I disagreed with, which I may come back to uh, at the end of my speech. But generally speaking, I felt that compared to some of the previous health debates which were brought to the chamber by the Labour Party in recent years, I felt that the, for the large part, a large part of what Dr Sims had to say was constructive. I want to address a couple of areas and uh, will, will be unashamedly parochial in doing so. Uh, the first is that I want to warmly welcome the announcement by the Cabinet Secretary at the start of the week that the additional funding for NHS Grampian to bring it within 1% of NRAC parity uh, one year early uh, was announced. I think that is extremely welcome uh, and will be welcomed by not just health professionals but patients as well. But I am sure I would not be uh, telling tales out of school to say that it, it would be important to look at the reports into NHS Grampian and recognise that additional funding is not the only solution to the issues and the challenges that are faced in NHS Grampian. Extra money does not, for example, buy you improved management ethos. That has to come through appropriate leadership within the NHS board. And I think it is vitally important, therefore, that all politicians in the North East 
get behind the new leadership team of Malcolm Wright as the interim chief executive and also Professor Stephen Logan as the new chair of the health board and make sure that they are being supported. And I would say that I, I, I did feel that the Labour Party's approach during the whole process in, in, in Grampian uh, left a lot to be desired. Firstly, there appears to have been, at the very best, a grudging acknowledgement uh, of the funding that has been provided, despite it being what Labour politicians had said needed to be done. But secondly, their approach in terms of the leadership situation at NHS Grampian, where when the board chair vacancy came up, the Labour Party decided to push and promote Councillor Barney Crockett as the new chair of NHS Grampian. Now, for those who are unfamiliar, this is the councillor who the Labour Party themselves deposed as leader of Aberdeen City Council because they didn't think he was up to the job of running the council. They then tried to promote him as somebody who was therefore up to the job of running the local health board. I think that leaves a lot to be desired in terms of the approach that the Labour Party locally have taken in terms of supporting NHS Grampian. I hope perhaps now we can start to see uh, a, a new chapter in terms of the approach being taken by the Labour Party now that they are under new stewardship in the health brief. In terms of the issue around delayed discharge, presiding officer, this merits, I think, some exploration. And Aberdeen was, was mentioned and highlighted by Dr Simpson. And indeed, it was during my time in administration in Aberdeen that we saw delayed discharge figures reduced to zero. And that came about as a result of a focused effort, both at health board level, but also at a local authority level, to drive down delayed discharge and ensure that the pathways from the acute setting to the social care setting were such that you did not have those situations arising. The, the difficulty that there is at present, and I'm dealing with a number of constituent cases which relate to delayed discharges, is the availability of care packages. And that's the real problem, the real thing that is blocking up the system at present. Now, I've heard it mentioned on a number of occasions that the answer to this, again, is a financial one, that if you offer the incentives for individuals to work in the care sector, that will create the capacity. The difficulty I have is that if you look at the situation in Aberdeen City and in Aberdeen Shire, it is not the same situation that is being faced in Aberdeenshire. You would expect if there were cost pressures arising within the northeast of Scotland, they would also be manifesting themselves in terms of the outcomes in Aberdeenshire. But that is not proving to be the case. So we have to look at what exactly is it that is being done in Aberdeen City at present that could potentially lead to some of those difficulties. Now, the Council has introduced a step-down facility between uh, the acute setting uh, and either the home or, or, or other environment at Clashy now in my constituency, and that's a welcome development. That's something I think we can support. But there are instances of individuals who ought to be at home with a care package, but who have been uh, put by the Council into care home settings, which I don't think is an appropriate method for managing delayed discharge, either for the system or for the individual who ought to be in their home setting were the packages in place. And I think that the direction of travel that the city has taken in establishing Bonacord Care, an arm's length social care company, which has no elected member scrutiny on its operations, I think is very troubling. It's also very troubling that the council has decided to abolish its social care committee and now only looks at children's services as part of the education committee, but there appears to be no strategic oversight or elected member oversight of adult and older people's services within the council setting. So I would ask the Cabinet Secretary, when she does have those discussions around delayed discharge, to look very carefully at how social care is being appropriately monitored in terms of elected member scrutiny at Aberdeen City Council, because I have some very big concerns there, and they ought to be concerns that should transcend political divides. F very briefly on the points that were raised by Dr Simpson, which and I took last a little 40 bit seconds. I, I do welcome the fact that Labour appear to have ditched their uh, review the whole NHS shtick that used to be the only thing that they brought to the Chamber in terms of National Health Service debates. My concern is that this uh, using the mansion tax to fund 1,000 extra nurses, uh, my understanding was they were going to promise 1,000 extra nurses whatever the SNP promised. So presumably if we said we'll use the mansion tax money to fund 1,000 extra nurses, they'll have to find 1,000 extra nurses on top of that. But it misunderstands how Barnet works. Barnet does not work on an assignment of revenue uh, based on how much is taken in. It is in, on the basis of expenditure, and the £250 million Labour is talking about is more than the Barnet consequential would be from any expenditure at a UK level. So they have to explain how they arrive at that figure. And it's all very well to complain about catchy slogans and sticking plaster solutions, but if all you're coming here with is a thousand extra please. nurses, it does somewhat betray a lot of the content, the constructive content that came forward in Dr Simpson's speech. Thank you so much. Colin Rhoda Grant, to be followed by Sandra White. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, after months and years of warnings, we watch in despair as the NHS crumbles under winter pressures. 
This is not a failure on the part of the hard-working staff. They've been vocal with their concerns about the state of the NHS. Sadly, they have also been ignored. We know that much of the NHS is operating on the goodwill of staff, working above and beyond to try and keep patients safe, often at the detriment of their own health. Despite this effort, on their part, we see operations cancelled, an increase in bed blocking and diminishing care in the community. I know how frustrating I find all of this. I can't imagine the frustration of those who work so hard on the front line of the NHS when they see this happening. We have a government that ignores what they're being told and uses their majority in this parliament to hide behind, and I'm sure they will do that again tonight. That does nothing to help the staff and patients that suffer due to their failure. Presiding officer, winter brings no surprises. It comes around every year, roughly around this time, and with it comes an increase in pressure on the NHS. This year, due to Christmas and New Year holidays butting up against weekends, this should, have been an un this should not have been underestimated. Indeed, it should have flagged up an additional issue, and plans should have been put in place eh, to ensure that there was capacity in the system. We now see the operations that have been cancelled the people that are being discharged before they should be, and others wait on trolleys. And this is becoming an annual occurrence under this government. How many more times must this happen before we see adequate planning for winter pressures? In order to keep people out of... I wonder if she would acknowledge, uh, the member would acknowledge that uh, £28 million went into preparing for winter pressures and indeed Highland uh, received a, a fair share of that resource and would she welcome the NRAC funding that NHS Highland is receiving next year which will help to address some of the delayed discharge issues that she's raising? Rhoda Grant. I certainly uh, welcome additional funding. What is very clear is that, that the planning that has gone into this winter has been inadequate, and this funding is coming too late to do anything with the crisis that is occurring right here, right now. Um, Presiding officer, we need to pe keep people out of hospital, and to do that, we need to make sure that they receive adequate care in the community when it's required, preventing their health deteriorating. Currently, people can wait for days before getting a GP appointment, and given that many surgeries were closed for eight days out of the 11 over the festive period, it's little wonder that conditions have deteriorated to the point where they need to go into hospital. Patients have been told to manage their own health and not go to A&E unless necessary, and that's correct. correct. But it's impossible. Over the festive period, not only were GPs shut, um, but there was very limited pharmacy cover over Christmas and New Year. In Highland and Argyll and Butte, a huge area, there was only one pharmacy open on Christmas Day and six on Boxing Day. A similar story for Hogmanay and the Borders, there were only six pharmacies open over the same period. And given the huge geographical areas, those health boards cover, it's absolutely shocking. If we're to keep people out of hospital, we need both reactive and proactive NHS within our communities. People are living longer, and that is a good thing, but it often means that they're living with complex conditions, conditions that we're now able to treat and manage, giving them additional years. However, those conditions become more complex to manage, and often the treatments for one condition exacerbate or indeed lead to another and so forth. We need the expertise in the community to help people manage their conditions in order to keep them out of hospital. And we've seen a decline in specialist nurses, and many of them being pulled away from their own area of speciality to fill gaps elsewhere. I welcome the announcement of MND nurses and would pay tribute to Gordon Aitman for campaigning successfully for this happen to happen. But we need specialists in the community and all disciplines to deal with the complex conditions that occur, and that will maximise health and manage care at home. We also need the ability to quickly pull in those services, along with social care services to support someone when they're beginning to struggle. Some intensive intervention in their own home or within the community could prevent the chronically ill or elderly going into hospital at all. Allied health professionals are underutilised in this respect. If we're able to help people become more active, assist with speech or swallowing, amongst other things, if someone's struggling at home, surely it's better um, to call a physio-occupational or speech therapist to help them in home 
rather than wait until they hit crisis and go into hospital. We hear terrible stories about old people being left in corridors and trolleys when they're frail and unable to look after themselves. And even a short time in hospital can disenable people who are used to looking after themselves at home. Uh, even a short period when they're unable to move about and fend for themselves can take months of physiotherapy and occupational therapy to re-enable. Much of what's happening in our hospitals is due to the government cutting nurses, cutting beds, but refusing to make that investment in the communities to change the balance of care. Their inability to deal with this is causing hardship and suffering, and waiting until the Public Body Scotland Act is implemented is too late. We need to change the balance of care now to relieve the pressure of our hospitals. Thank you for finishing so swiftly. Now I call on Sandra White to be followed by Nanette Miller. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. Uh, can I start, first of all, President Officer, uh, by paying tribute and thanking uh, the staff of our health service, not only the consultants, nurses, doctors, ambulance staff, but all of the staff that ensure that our health service is run as smoothly as possible. And I'm sure that all of us here in this chamber can absolutely agree on that. I want to say I appreciated Jackson Carlaw's contribution, which I thought was measured, and uh, may even have been a cry for unity in some parts of it. But there was one aspect of Jackson Carlaw's uh, contribution which I think touched on a very important area, and that's the creeping introduction of Labour Westminster policies to this Scottish Parliament. When you look at this motion, and I want to go through some of this motion, and like others, and particularly uh, from the SNP, I can't quite fathom them out how uh, a motion called Scotland's Future is just nothing except about how Labour, if they ever get into power, would do a better job than the SNP on health. It just doesn't seem, seem to ring true to me when you look at Scotland's Future, and that is all it mentions. Now, one of the parts in the, the actual motion mentions Scotland's Labour commitment to fund 1,000 extra nurseries. And this has been spoken about also, and Malcolm Chisholm mentioned the fact about the RCN and about the 1,000 extra nurses. But when the RCN were asked about these 1,000 extra nurses, and if they knew how Mr Murphy, because he was the one who mentioned the 1,000 extra nurses, how that came about, the RCN said they had no idea. They had no idea how this had came about, and they had certainly never put forward this 1,000 nurses to it. So that's something that perhaps only Mr Murphy knows, and perhaps don't the Labour Party themselves here in the Scottish Parliament know. If they do know, I'd be happy if they brought it forward and, and told us how they got to this so-called 1,000 nurses. But I think I may have touched on something uh, further than that as well. And then the motion then goes on to talk about the mansion tax. Now, we all know... The mansion. Yes, I'll take an intervention. Rhoda Grant. Do I understand rightly from Sandra White and other members of her party, she doesn't welcome the extra thousand nurses, and indeed they won't be matching the extra thousand nurses? <laughs> Sandra White. I, th I think someone just answered for you there. That's nonsense. Now go on. We to cut tell out you. the front bench interchange and allow Sandra White to proceed, please. Thank you. I I'll reiterate then <coughs> what the French bench said. That's nonsense. So I think Rhoda has got <coughs> got her answer. But if I can just talk about the mansion tax, and I think people really have to to know about this particular. If the mansion tax, which Jim Murphy has put forward, it's only if Labour win the election in Westminster. So I think you're being a wee bit generous there in that respect. I think you're being a wee bit generous there in Could that respect. Could we just let Sandra you're White probably... make the speeches, please, and everyone else Thank keep quiet? You. Thank you very much. Thank you, presiding Officer. Now, I want to go on, and I think I'll pick up on the point that Mark Macdonald made about the mansion tax. And when you look at it, the Labour sums don't even add up. And Mark had actually mentioned that in his contribution. Now, you mentioned the fact, and this is Jim Murphy actually mentioned it, Westminster Labour, UK-wide mansion tax to fund an additional 1,000 nurses in Scotland. And you claim that the mansion tax would generate £1.2 billion across the UK, and you expect to see £250 million come to Scotland, which is more than 20% of the total revenue in which will be raised. So that's one point. Another point which Mark Macdonald brought up was, and even under the reality of it is, under the Barnett formula, it would be even less. So let's just say the figures are nonsensical. Now, if I could just further on from that about the mansion tax, and it mentions it again, and here, as I said, in the so-called future, the motion for the future, let's look at uh, what Labour MPs 
say about this mansion tax, which is put forward by one of their own Scottish MPs. Margaret Hodge, Chair of Public Accounts Committee, too crude to work properly. I don't think it's the world's most sensible idea. Diane Abbott, I think we've all heard that on Radio 4, she mentioned just a couple of days ago, Jim Murphy isn't helping matters by fact, could you just let me finish Diane Abbott's quote? Uh, Jim Murphy isn't helping matters by firing off without consulting. There's a lot of discussion and debate that needs to go on about how we can implement a mansion tax fairly. Jim Murphy is jumping the gun in a highly unscrupulous way. Diane Abbott said that the point I'm trying to I'm, the point I'm trying to get across here is it would have been much more honest. It would have been much more honest if the Labour Party here in the Scottish Parliament, when they put forward the so-called motion, if it had been in health, which it is, they said it was in health. But if the ideas had came from the Labour Party here in Scotland. One minute. Basically, this is a reiteration of a Jim Murphy press release. And I find that quite dis no, my sorry, last, my minute. last minute. Sorry. I find that quite despicable. And it's quite sad, actually. You have a, a pool of people here who are elected by the Scottish people and they can't even bring their own ideas to this parliament for a debate on health, which they call the future. It's nothing to do at all with the title, but I think you should actually think to yourselves why you couldn't bring forward or your own ideas instead of a press release from Mr Murphy, a Westminster MP who doesn't even have a seat Could in the close, next please? Scottish Parliament elections. Now call on Annette Milne to be followed by John Mason. Dr Milne. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, another Labour debate, another predictable war of words between the two major parties over the health service. So soon after the very recent Labour debate on health held on the 3rd of December, I find it really quite difficult to find anything very new to say. Um, I think we are all agreed that the current failings within the NHS in Scotland need to be addressed. And I think what we actually need for the improvement of health provision and a sustainable future for the NHS in Scotland is clearly stated in Jackson Carlow's amendment. If NHS Scotland is to achieve a sustainable future in the face of the many challenges facing it today, then all political parties must agree and unite in support of a long-term strategic plan and work with the government to develop and implement such a plan within the lifetime of this Parliament. It is urgent, and we can't afford to sit around and argue while the express train carrying the demographic time bomb hurtles along the tracks towards us. We all agree that a and &E services have been under severe pressure in recent weeks, and that is for a number of reasons. But, you know, I remember being called in to help on my night off as a hospital resident doctor in 1966 because there were so many admissions from a and &E that patients had to be spread across wards throughout Aberdeen Royal Infirmary and the on-duty staff on the receiving ward simply couldn't cope with, without more help. So the seasonal pressure on emergency service is not a new phenomenon. What is new is that many more people turn up at A&E with conditions better treated by self-medication or by their GP. What's new is that A&E departments are busy throughout the week instead of just at the weekend because of more people abusing alcohol and drugs. And what's also new is the serious difficulty in finding care in the community for an increasing number of frail elderly people who are fit for discharge from hospital but cannot access appropriate care at home. Having to keep these people in hospital, which only increases their frailty, leads to difficulty in finding hospital beds for people who need to be admitted from A&E and results in patients being detained in that department or on trolleys where casualty wards are full. And of course, at a time of year when icy pavements are, are, are a hazard, as I discovered to my cost this morning, and flu and colds and chest infections uh, are common, attendances at A&E rise dramatically and the system is stressed, resulting in the cancellation of routine procedures so that acute cases can be dealt with. I have to say I do agree with the Cabinet Secretary that key to solving the A&E problem is to improve the patient's flow through the system, although patient awareness of the appropriate point to access the NHS needs to be addressed, and also how to attract and retain more medical staff, particularly at consultant level, into the emergency med medicine specialty. At present, because of a significant volume of inappropriate attendance at A&E departments, the existing staff, highly qualified in trauma medicine, are often unable to use their specialist skills and the job becomes unrewarding, particularly when they're on a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week rota of work. 
I also agree that the integration of health and social care, if it works effectively, should help patient flow very significantly. But there are many hurdles yet to be overcome, and I don't think we should under, uh, underestimate that, in breaking down the professional barriers which still exist between health and social care, at least in some parts of the country. With regard to funding, there are ongoing party political arguments about commitment to fund the NHS in Scotland, but there is no doubt that the Conservative Party is committed to this, both at Westminster and here. The nearly 1.4 billion of Barnet consequentials received by the NHS in Scotland since 2010 is testament to that, as is the more recent substantial funding for the NHS, uh, extra funding, announced by the Chancellor in his autumn statement. I must, to be fair, also acknowledge the extra funding for health boards announced by the Cabinet Secretary this week, which is welcome, particularly from my point of view, the 5.2 million allocated to NHS Grampian, which has undoubtedly been significantly below parity with other health boards under the NRAC formula for a number of years. The NHS, of course, will always absorb any resources available to it, and it is crucially important to maintain commitment to safeguard its funding. But, Presiding Officer, the answer to the undeniable problems currently facing the NHS, particularly in community care and A&E, is not necessarily just to throw more money at them, but to sit down and plan properly for the future. I personally think this has to be done at a cross-party level, because patients want results, not political point scoring. And I think we'd do politics as well as patients a lot of good if we took a joint approach to, a strategic, to strategic planning within the NHS. Jackson Carlo and I had a good working relationship with the previous health team, at least as we've heard until just before the referendum. And I hope this will develop under the new health secretary. I look forward to the meeting she's arranged later this month with opposition spokesmen. And I hope that this will be the start of a positive working relationship with her and her team of ministers. I know that people outside this place are tired of political sniping. And I think we can overcome this if we can overcome this behaviour in the interest of developing and sustaining our precious and much-loved NHS, then I think we'll be doing an enormous service, not only to politics, but to the large and very dedicated body of people who work in NHS Scotland, and also to the patients who depend on their services. Thank you. Thanks very much. Now I call on John Mason to be followed by John Pentland. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. And I think, uh, first, can we start off with the strengths of the NHS? And let's remember that we do not have a system like the United States, where richer people get a gold-plated service and poorer people get the absolute minimum. Nor should we forget that many parts of the world have virtually no health service at all, public or private. The Canadian friend I have quoted in a previous debate and who I was speaking to just after New Year said to me, totally unprompted, that if one thing annoys him, it is people in Scotland slating the NHS. He has lived in a number of countries around the world, and he reminded me that in most of these countries, people are very jealous of what we have here. Of course, it is the opposition's job to look for things that are wrong, rather than welcoming the things that are going well. I have occasionally done that myself in a past life. And to be fair, Labour do mention the hardworking NHS staff in their motion. So let's keep things in perspective. Of course, I'm happy to accept, as others have done, that there is and always will be room for improvement. But if we go, it would be good if we could have a mature debate eh, on that rather than just rhyming off easy slogans. And I think that is something of what Nanette Milne has just been saying. I would suggest that sometimes at committees we are able to have more nuanced discussions than here in the chamber. At Finance Committee, for example, we have had a number of sessions with an emphasis on preventative spending. Now, do we really believe in that? If so, how should we be spending our, our health money? These are the kind of questions we should be discussing. Putting more and more resources into accident and emergency is ultimately a sign of failure. If we only do that, it would show we had given up on preventative spend. Another issue at the Finance Committee has been whether we emphasise inputs, for example, the number of nurses, outputs, for example, the numbers treated at accident and emergency, or outcomes, i.e. a healthier population. Should we be making the number of nurses the key factor, after all, where do we want to go in the long term? Presumably, we want a healthier population, which would mean fewer hospitals and fewer nurses. Or, if there are to be more nurses, they would be keeping people at home rather than treating them at A&E. Surely that would be a success. But we do face a challenge in sticking to outcomes, as they are often harder to measure, are more long-term, 
and do not have such a close link to the budget. So the easy way out is to count numbers of hospitals and numbers of nurses. And I confess that as an accountant, my profession can be guilty of emphasising what can be easily measured. But if we are serious about outcomes and preventative spend, it is going to take self-discipline on all our parts and political leadership which avoids petty point scoring. I did feel the last part of the Conservative amendment is along these lines, and Jackson Carlaw in his speech it got the tone right, I think. However, not only does the government have to produce a long-term strategic plan, presumably emphasising outcomes and preventative spending, but opposition parties will have to place less emphasis on inputs. We cannot spend money on everything, and in fact we have also heard witnesses at the Finance Committee during the budget process say that they think we are spending too much on health, and we would be better spending more on growing the economy and getting more people into jobs that might help people's health in the longer term. I do not particularly agree with that argument, but it is there. So there are choices to be made on whether we spend on health or on some other part of the budget. And there are also choices as to how we spend the money within the health sector. Should we spend more on early years and less on older folk? Should we spend more on preventative, less on reactive? Should we spend more on healthy food for children, less on end-of-life drugs? Because let us be clear that we have to make choices in all of this. Labour can pretend we can have more money for everything, but I do not believe that can be done. The public does not believe that can be done. And simple arithmetic says it cannot be done. Also, can I mention the intended Lib Dem amendment with its emphasis on mental health, which many of us would welcome. But if there are to be more mental health beds and nurses, presumably they want to cut mainstream beds and nurses. That is a valid choice for them to make, but perhaps they would have more credibility if they had actually said it in the amendment. Others have said, but it's also worth saying again, that accident and emergency is not the most appropriate place for every health problem. When the announcements were made on Monday about the extra funding, I think I heard a radio piece correctly, which said that actually some 30% of people going to A&E could have been better attended to elsewhere. Can I also just mention the subject of privatisation within the health sector? In your last minute. Although others have uh, mentioned that already, um, it, it, in, a, in a people intensive area like health, it is pretty likely that if the private sector can do something cheaper, it is because they have fewer staff or staff on poorer terms and conditions. So if we are serious about the living wage, doing away with zero hour contracts, proper holiday entitlements and decent pension provision, let us not be hoodwinked into thinking that a cheaper bid has some kind of magic formula and produced money out of nowhere. No, it has come about nine times out of ten because there will be fewer staff, lower pensions, longer hours, etc. Now that's not to say the NHS could not do things better. Why are GPs and dentists self-employed rather than being employed? I'm not entirely sure. It does seem a bit illogical. So yes, let us look at how we could use the current resources better, but let us be realistic about the financial resources we do have. So, presiding officer, I believe we do have an NHS to be proud of. Let us always seek to improve it, but let us keep our eyes on the long-term goals and not just on what is easy to count. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I now call on John Pentland to be followed by Kevin Stewart. Presiding officer, when it comes to the Scottish Government's treatment time guarantee, NHS, Lan NHS Lanarkshire did un unbelievably well with just eight breaches. Now, this came as something of a surprise in light of the reports that I have had from constituents. People can wait a long time to see a, cons a consultant, then many more weeks for tests, then another long wait for an appointment to get a diagnosis and discuss treatment. Only then does the guarantee kick in. And if tests are to be repeated on other, or other tests done or appointments are unsuitable times, that all adds up to the time and referring a patient back to their GP resets the clock. So before you go to the actual treatment, a year or so can pass. And suffice to say that Lanarkshire's 18-week target is not quite as good. But before I go any further, you know, I think we've got to make it clear that NHS workers are without any doubt extremely hardworking and dedicated. They are having to cope with extreme pressure under a heavy workload in face of staff shortages due to the unfilled post and sickness absence. Now, this is not just my opinion. And in June, the chair of the BMA said 
What I have seen over the past five years is a continuing crisis management of the longest car crash in my memory. And just last week, the RCN Scotland director, Theresa Fife, said, the whole system is creaking at the seams and the last few weeks have been seen a perfect storm of conditions that demonstrate just how perilous the state of the NHS is. Now, this echoes statements made by Lanarkshire NHS Board about the fragility of services such as A&E, &E, with plans already lodged with the Scottish Government for closures of up to 48 hours and plans being developed for longer-term closures. The fragility is due to the lack of staff, particularly for certain posts and, and disciplines. And when I look at the NHS Lanarkshire staffing report, I can't help thinking that there are far too many shortages highlighted in the red and amber. And in one year alone, NHS Lanarkshire staff complained about the staffing shortages 434 times. Now, that is over 35 times a month and rarely a day goes by without a complaint. There were also the whistleblowers who bravely went to the press about their worries about the lack of suitably trained workers. And in response to their concerns, the independent report on NHS Lanarkshire neonatal services concluded that the complaints about the lack of a specialist neonatal staff were justified. Shana Robinson. I'm going to argue for a second that, that, that finance is the answer to all of these uh, issues and of course partly uh, is a challenge to recruit in some of these specialities. However, I'm sure the member will welcome the fact that NHS Lanarkshire is going to be one of the main beneficiaries of the NRAC uplift for next year, which will hopefully help with some of the expansion of posts that he's um, alluding to. From Penland. Okay, another member, I do welcome the money. But I think what the Cabinet Secretary needs to realise, what you're offering is only a short-term short fix. Because in Lanarkshire, we have been moving from crisis to crisis to crisis. And I think you, really, you as Cabinet Secretary need to realise that. Now, when we see the impact of staffing and resource problems and the repeated failure to meet such targets in any, any waiting times, in October and November last year, 170 Lanarkshire patients waited 12 hours or more to be treated in their hospitals. Across the rest of Scotland, over the same period, only 142 patients waited 12, or more, 12 hours or more. Audit Scotland also highlighted NHS Lanarkshire's failure to meet targets in relation to outpatient waiting times and delayed discharges. Then, there was that infamous leak chief executive document which showed a £400 million gap in sustainable funding and highlighted the problems caused by the lack of service reconfiguration in NHS Lanarkshire. <clears throat> and then Lanarkshire's mental health services are still dealing with the problems arising from the mental health reconfiguration plans. And nearly a year ago, the rapid review of NHS Lanarkshire highlighted the problems of Lanarkshire's a &E services. Yet, a &E is still under pressure, and all the more so as a result of the di disintegration of GP out of our services in Lan Lanarkshire, which the NHS says have reached the point where it is becoming extremely difficult to, difficult to provide a safe service. Let you draw to a close, please. President officer, Cabinet Secretary, you need to realise that when staff, patients and stakeholders are criticising and using words and phrases like perilous, fragile, creaking at the seams, the longest car crash in memory, you need to realise, Cabinet Secretary, that the Scottish Government has to stop pretending that everything is OK, is basically OK. And I would hope that you would agree with me that Lanarkshire NHS is in crisis. 
Thanks very much. I now call on Kevin Stewart, after which I move to the closing speeches. Please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And yesterday I welcomed uh, the uh, 15.2 million additional funding for NHS Grampian, which means an uplift in uh, the next financial year of 49.1 million. Uh, and I mentioned uh, the late Brian Adam, who campaigned for years uh, to get parity uh, for NHS Grampian. And he did so before he came to this place, when there was a Tory government in power at Westminster, when Labour were at power at Westminster, under a Labour Liberal executive here, and uh, while the SNP have been in power. And we've seen that shift from our birth note uh, with this government to NRAC, and now we're seeing that parity take place. And I'm sure uh, that he would be uh, very proud uh, that that has been delivered. Uh, and I would also like to pay um, uh, my respects to, to others who have done likewise. Uh, Dr Milne's speech today I thought was uh, very, very good uh, and, as per usual, uh, very thoughtful uh, about the health service. And I know that, like Brian, uh, Dr Milne has consistently uh, called uh, for that parity of funding. Uh, what does annoy me is some of the chancers who have discovered only in recent times that that parity um, was required. But I probably shouldn't say very much more uh, about that. Presiding officer, um, like others, um, some others, I attended uh, the NHS Grampian annual review uh, on uh, Monday. Uh, and uh, one of the most refreshing things for me uh, about that review was there was a complete and utter honesty about where they thought they could do better, where they were not doing as well as they should be. Um, that, I think, as I say, is extremely refreshing and was not the case even a few months back. The issues that they mentioned where there were difficulties are exactly the same issues that have been crossing my desk and probably the desk of a large amount of colleagues in the North East for some time. Uh, difficulties round about orthopaedics, um, round about dermatology, uh, round about mental health services for young folk. They recognise these difficulties and uh, it seems that they are taking action to try and resolve these difficulties. Uh, and that, I think, is extremely good news. I'll give way to Mr Hume. Jim Hume. Kevin Stewart for taking intervention. Uh, during those deliberations uh, uh, and meeting that happened with NHS Grampian, was it brought, uh, and you mentioned about mental health and young people, was it brought up that Aberdeen City does not have one single CHAMS uh, bed at all? And were they looking to address that? Um, it wasn't Kevin actually Stewart. mentioned at that meeting, but I have raised that separately, uh, Mr Hume, previously. Uh, and, you know, there is uh, um, uh, uh, a promise from uh, the new team there that they are looking at these things very, very carefully indeed. And I have to say um, that, uh, again, uh, the responses that I've been receiving have been particularly refre refreshing. He will understand that sometimes you don't get into the finer detail um, at annual review, but I, I know that that is being looked at. And the strap line um, that they used in their presentation, um, and I have to say that sometimes I, I don't really uh, agree uh, with the use of these strap lines, uh, but I think was uh, the right one, caring, listening and improving. And I have to say, from what I heard on Monday and what I have heard from the new team since they uh, have uh, came into post, uh, they are certainly... Uh, caring about the areas uh, where they think um, that uh, there are difficulties. They are certainly listening, not only to parliamentarians, uh, but we heard uh, on Monday how they were uh, dealing uh, with uh, the views of groups and individuals. Uh, and I think already we are seeing signs of improvement. Uh, and I think, you know, we can do uh, what politicians do all of the time uh, and snipe at one another about uh, uh, the, uh, the bad things and uh, forget to mention the good things. We often don't give folk time to breathe to actually uh, improve uh, on, on what is currently there. And I think, you know, we need to take uh, a, a different attitude, a different tack when we're discussing um, our National Health Service uh, so that we can, uh, in all honesty, 
uh, point out where there are, are, are some difficulties, uh, and then go on with the job of trying to improve those areas uh, of the business to make sure that patients are treated as best as they possibly can be. I'll take a very brief intervention from Mr. Robertson. We'll be very brief. You have it's very brief. seconds uh, left. The, the member, will the member acknowledge that the hard work of the staff is testament to the patient satisfaction? Uh, I, would, I would certainly agree with that. Uh, and I have to say that in terms of the staff in NHS Grampian, although we've been told about all of these difficulties that there have been, uh, they have performed absolutely brilliantly during this time, including under a lot of media pressure and a lot of unnecessary pressure uh, from politicians. Uh, and I, I would always say uh, hats off to those folks who deliver on a day-to-day -day basis for the people of Scotland uh, and deliver uh, for the National Health Service. Thank you. Officer. And thank you. We now move to closing speeches and I call on Jackson Carlow. Six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I move the amendment in my name, which I may have overlooked to do when I spoke earlier? And, and can I begin by thanking Jim Hume, who observed that the baby boomers have now got old. <laughs> well, I hope I don't feel as old as Mr Hume looks, if I can put it that way, and I'll thank him very much for his observation and move smartly on from that as one of those baby boomers. Uh, there were a lot of contributions in the debate as it wore on uh, to which I, I, I warmed, but I'm going to concentrate on just a couple. I want to pick up on something Christian Allard followed up on, and that was my concern about uh, the potential for the uh, health service to be weaponized in the language of uh, Mr. Murphy's leader at Westminster. Um, and Mr. Allard said it won't work. Well, you see, that's the problem. It does. Uh, because um, it was the most effective yes campaign tool in the referendum. When they weaponized the NHS with the outright bilge that it would be privatized on September the 19th if we didn't vote yes, hundreds of thousands of Scots were motivated to vote in the referendum on that basis. And I'm afraid the truth is that if you weaponize in this language we suddenly have evolved the health service, I'm afraid it does work. And the point is that as a parliament, as a political, as a series of political parties, we have to be prepared to rise above that. And I am concerned, and I say this not from the conduct of Mr. Simpson and the way that he moved the motion, but in its tone, that there is a temptation to do exactly that. And it brings me directly to my taxi driver this morning, who is a lifelong former shop steward and labour voter who said to me that he was absolutely dismayed by the mansion tax. He said it reminded him of the rabbit-out-of-the-hat spin politics of the Blair Brown era, uh, and he was absolutely dismayed by it. And this is a man who lives in East Renfrewshire and has voted for Mr Murphy, I have to say. He was concerned that he'd gone from being the quiet, deliberate man to the angry man who was now going to demonstrate his credentials for standing up for Scotland, which has to be the most flaccid, flashy, flim-flam mansion tax, a preposterous confection of a policy, which, as Sandra White, Mark MacDonald and others illustrated, has been completely ridiculous. Uh, I, I, think, I, I think it was Rona Grant stood up and said, do we not want these thousands, as if they're standing ready at the moment on the border, waiting to cross over if only the SNP will embrace them? It's an ephemeral nonsense. Scottish Conservatives have argued for a thousand nurses on the basis of a tough decision, which other parties don't agree with, about the reintroduction of the prescription charge at the level it was at when it was abolished, a properly costed and funded way to underwrite that policy. Other parties don't agree. I accept that. It's also the case that elsewhere in the United Kingdom, in other health services, they need the additional resource of nurses too. The right way is to increase, when possible, health spending and for the consequential that would arise from that to come to Scotland, or for the Scottish budget to be directed in that way. But to simply talk about a mansion tax is really, I think, to insult the intelligence of voters. And I have to say, if that is weaponising the health service, then I very much hope it doesn't work in the election that we're about to enter into. I think there was some very... I, I think uh, Mark MacDonald made the comment, and I think, again, Richard Simpson did, and I said, I think, make some 
telling points and barbs in his speech, which the government would do well to take note of. But he said it was a change from the kind of motions we'd had in recent times from Labour. And it's true, dear old Neil Finlay was forever asking us to look to Cuba and Venezuela for our health service policy. And it was interesting and refreshing to see Dr Simpson concentrate on the actual dynamic with which we're confronted. But, you know, across Scotland, as we speak, the pressure that we've talked about is not illusory. It's not some fanciful debating point in here. While we talk this afternoon, it's not something that's passed. It's not something that's over. Doctors and nurses are rushing around packed wards. Many of them have been closed because of norovirus, with all the pressures in terms of bed blocking, as patients are unable to be moved to other parts of the hospital to undertake treatments and the consequential backlog and consequence of that. They are managing as best they can. Their legs are as exhausted as is their spirit. And a debate in here which is based on nothing more than recrimination can nothing, do nothing for their morale or their expectation. I think we all know the measure of the task that is there. It's possibly a bit late in the day to come in and say we've just discovered there's an aging population, I would say, to Mr Macmillan. We've understood the consequences. Mental health, primary care, the avoidable conditions, dementia, the public contract that we need the uh, public to have with the NHS that we, that we all wish to see. The atmosphere, the reward for staff, not just financial, but in terms of job satisfaction, which is leading far too many of those we train to seek employment and health services elsewhere. These are the challenges collectively that we have to face. And I really look to the two concluding spokesmen for the government and for the Labour Party to inspire the public with hope, to inspire the staff in the NHS with hope that this is not going to be a political tribal fight, but this is going to be a genuine effort to find a way forward strategically for the health service in Scotland around which we can all unite and which collectively we can all deliver. Many thanks. I now call on Jamie Hepburn. Eight minutes or thereby, Minister. Thank you very much. Uh, I've sort of, uh, listened uh, very closely to the debate and I will try to uh, pick up on a number of, of uh, points raised over the course of my closing uh, contribution. But can I uh, first of all uh, turn to the uh, opening and indeed the closing remarks of uh, Jackson Carl and also of uh, Nanette Milne. They both spoke of uh, the ambitions for the NHS uh, being uh, shared and indeed uh, John Mason uh, reminded us of uh, the uh, advantageous position that we have in uh, Scotland with our health service by comparison to many uh, other parts of the world. And can I say, I, I do recognise that all of us in this uh, chamber have a collective uh, interest in ensuring uh, the NHS is effective uh, working uh, going forward. I, I agree with that uh, absolutely. And it, it is clear, it's clear, been clear from uh, today's uh, debate, President and Officer, we will not always agree uh, with one another on every uh, single point, but where we can uh, work together, I think we should uh, seek uh, to do so. And Cabinet Secretary uh, made uh, that point in her uh, opening remarks. She will seek to work uh, with uh, opposition spokespeople on a consensual basis. I make that uh, commitment uh, as well. And uh, I know that the uh, Minister for Public Health will work on that uh, basis uh, uh, too. Uh, I should, of course, uh, say, though, uh, Sir, we do recognise that the NHS uh, faces uh, challenges. The government does not uh, shy away from that fact. And indeed, if you uh, look at our amendment that has been presented uh, today, uh, in the amendment we recognise there have been challenges in meeting the increasing demands in a &E departments. We acknowledge that further steps are required to reduce delays and discharge. The Cabinet Secretary has set that out on many times uh, in this chamber since she has been appointed uh, to office. We also acknowledge that uh, further steps are required to improve patient flow and ensure that a &E targets are sustainably met in the future. We are not shying away from the task that is uh, before us and indeed we have put that in uh, our uh, amendment which I commend to members uh, across uh, the chamber but I would make the point that, that this government has a clear uh, vision and direction for uh, our uh, NHS and we are committed to delivering uh, this vision ensuring person-centred uh, care so that each and every uh, person in Scotland receives a fair uh, and appropriate service each and every time uh, they acquire it, which is, of course, no less than they deserve. And, of course, uh, next week the Parliament will debate uh, the 2020 vision uh, for uh, the NHS, and members can uh, contribute uh, to, uh, to that. Uh, we continue to work with uh, our NHS boards, putting in place a range of actions to support the delivery 
of our vision. We've set targets for CAM, psychological therapies, alcohol and drugs, as well as IVF treatment, all of which will offer uh, patients uh, the best available care. And we do this uh, because uh, we can do this because of uh, the record levels of funding uh, the, that we have put in place, the record levels of staffing uh, that we have, and their commitment to invest in the NHS capital uh, 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 and infrastructure. Uh, and uh, I think I want to uh, put on record that there have been uh, achievements. Uh, waiting times under this government have dramatically improved since March uh, 2007, when only 85 per cent of new inpatient day cases uh, were seen within 18 uh, weeks. Uh, and indeed, it was this uh, government that removed the availability uh, status code, which meant that some 35,000 patients had no uh, guarantee with uh, significant numbers of patients waiting well over a year for their treatment. And I think it would be appropriate at this juncture uh, to uh, thank uh, all those who work in the NHS for uh, their efforts. It's down to their efforts that we've seen uh, those improvements in uh, waiting times. And having uh, mentioned uh, targets, I want to turn to the contribution of Dr uh, Simpson because that was uh, uh, an area uh, he touched on. But he also uh, raised concerns about uh, the number of uh, uh, GPs uh, per uh, capita. And I thought it was interesting, he, he was quite selective in selecting the northeast of England only, because if we look at GP headcount over uh, the piece from 2006 to 2014, uh, GP headcount in Scotland is up 6.9%. And in Scotland, we have one GP per uh, 1,077 uh, people, whereas in England, it's one GP per 1,339 uh, people. So we actually have a, a good uh, record in uh, that uh, regard. Of course, yes. Dr. The reason I used the North East was not out of some selective thing from me. That was the Nuffield report. They used the North East of England as a comparator because it has very similar problems to Scotland. So that's why I used that. And they actually got 115% of the funding when Scotland actually uh, deployed only 99% in terms of the increase that was given by the UK government. Well, I make the point that one? over the piece 2006 to 2014, we have increased uh, GP headcount uh, by 6.9 per cent. So in that regard, we are uh, delivering uh, more GPs per person uh, in uh, uh, Scotland. Can I, I turn to the issue of the uh, treatment uh, time uh, guarantee? Uh, uh, clearly, there is, uh, of course, this point that there are patients not being seen uh, within uh, that uh, uh, time frame. Uh, I should uh, say... Uh, that uh, the six months data from uh, ISD's New Ways Warehouse uh, indicates that the majority of patients that breached the 12 weeks were seen within uh, 16 uh, weeks. So those who were not seen uh, within the 12 week uh, target time, and we absolutely want to deliver that uh, target, but those who were uh, uh, not seen within that time were seen pretty quickly uh, thereafter. But let me make clear, we expect boards to meet uh, that uh, uh, target and of course, we should make the point, uh, President Officer, that uh, 600,000 people have been seen in uh, that time since uh, the guarantee was uh, introduced. And of course, that's why uh, Duncan McNeill uh, made the point, was it not, that we have uh, come a long way uh, in the last decade. He made the point uh, that uh, a decade ago, many uh, of those sitting around the health committee uh, table were inundated with cases involving people who could not get uh, an operation. He said they had disappeared from his caseload. So we will not abandon that guarantee. I thought it was very interesting to hear from Dr Simpson that that is not a guarantee they would have put in place. And it's one that I think if I picked him up correctly in saying that he would uh, seek uh, to uh, remove. And let me be clear, without that commitment, I think we would be in danger of letting standards slide. We would be in danger of moving it backwards. The Cabinet Secretary made the point, and she was quite correct to do so, that tough targets result and uh, lead to good results. And I think uh, I'll be looking with great interest to see uh, if Labour's manifesto commits to removing uh, that commitment to treat within 12 weeks. And we can, uh, if they are returned to government, returning to the days of 35,000 patients uh, languishing on hidden waiting lists. Uh, can I turn to uh, some of the uh, other uh, comments that were made over the course of the debate? Jim Hume uh, mentioned uh, mental health. John Mason uh, mentioned the Liberal Democrat amendment, which of course was not accepted. Uh, set out uh, issues around uh, mental health. I, I totally agree that this should be a priority area. We, of course, held a debate uh, on uh, that uh, subject matter uh, last 
uh, week. I think it is a subject matter we should uh, return to. Again, I accept uh, the point, Mr. There have been challenges uh, there too. Some of the challenges in uh, mental health services are uh, born of uh, good news. For example, uh, CAMS is under pressure because more people are presenting and wanting to access uh, help and assistance uh, from uh, CAMS uh, services. That is not in of itself a bad thing. That is a good thing that more people are seeking uh, assistance. But of course, again, I expect health boards to meet our targets in that regard. Can I turn to John Pentland's uh, uh, comments? He Final spoke, 30 seconds, uh, please. Indeed, uh, President, so he spoke about the challenges in NHS Lanarkshire. I uh, recognise uh, that there are challenges in the NHS Lanarkshire. It covers my area as well. But he uh, spoke of uh, long waits before uh, treatment. Uh, can I confirm uh, that NHS Scotland has consistently delivered the 18 weeks referral uh, treat to treatment target in Lanarkshire uh, in September 2014? 93.4% it was seen within that period. That's over uh, the 90% standard. In Wales, where the Labour Party run the health service, they have a 26-week referral to treatment target. Only 85.7% of patients were seen and treated within the target during September 2014. It's just one indication of many, uh, President Officer, why the NHS is safe in the hands of the SNP. And I now call on Jenny Mara to wind up the debate on behalf of the Labour Party. Ms Mara, you have until 4.59. Please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, I'd like to start my cl uh, closing remarks this afternoon by turning to the issue, the biggest issue in the health service in Scotland today, uh, delayed discharge. Shona Robinson herself has uh, said this afternoon, as she said on the television on Sunday, that she was the first to admit um, that we have a problem with delayed discharge in our hospitals. And she said this afternoon that it is her biggest priority and we welcome that. Because I think we have all heard appreciation across this chamber this afternoon of the complex challenge that delayed discharge is. And every single situation is different because we are talking about individuals and the choices that they make and the packages and the care and the support around them, perhaps in the last years of their lives. And my initial meetings with the chief executives of health boards across this country reflect that challenge in boards up and down the country. And we know that blocks in patient flow, as Nanette Milne said this afternoon, exacerbate the pressures we have seen in our accident and emergency departments over the past couple of weeks, as accident emergency departments are not able to move patients through the hospital. It is a planning and an organisational challenge as well, and it is one that has been highlighted by Audit Scotland. But I would also think, and I hope that members across the, uh, the chamber would agree with me, that it does need extra resource. So on this point, I would ask the Cabinet Secretary a couple of questions. I know she is committed to uh, interim, interim beds, but the £65 million she re-announced at the weekend has been calculated on the NRAC formula, so letting the health boards catch up, as it were. And the Scottish Government's press release uh, that was issued this weekend specifically says that that money is for the cost of expensive new drugs. So I would ask the Cabinet Secretary this afternoon, where is the extra money, that extra resource to support the biggest challenge, her biggest challenge, delays, delayed discharge? And can the Cabinet Secretary, if she's about to intervene, tell us what is also happening to that other £60 million from the autumn statement? I'm happy to confirm, first of all, that the health service will get £380 million of additional money next year. We have said what we will do with £65 million out of the £127 million that has been announced. I will be making further announcements about the rest of that resource. But the NRAC uplift is for boards to meet a whole range of pressures. It's down to them what those priorities are. Well, I, I welcome the, the Cabinet Secretary's comments, but I hope that she will make some money specifically available for the challenge of, dis of delayed discharge, since she has made it her own priority. Now, Presiding Officer, Labour will not support the Government's amendment tonight for the simple reason that we cannot, in a Parliament, vote for a Government amendment that congratulates itself on breaking the law. The Cabinet Secretary... <coughs> excuse me... Officer. The Cabinet Secretary herself does not seem to understand, and the Minister just highlighted this as he closed, the difference between government targets and the law of this land. It was this 
SNP government's decision to vote what should have been a health target into a legally binding law for treatment within 12 weeks. Um, if, allow me to make a little bit of progress on this. So for 12,500 people across this country, this government has broken their legally binding law to them and the legally binding law of this land. And what is their legal recourse, Cabinet Secretary? Usually, when a law is broken, the person against whom the breach has been committed has some sort of recourse in this country. Will the Cabinet Secretary do the decent thing and at least apologise to the 12,500 people who have had their legal rights breached by this SNP government? Or, or is this a government with so little respect for that law that they will use it as a PR stunt to convince people that they are the, they are the custodians of our NHS? If the Cabinet Secretary would like to respond. I'm, I'm not, Secretary. not sure I got the last point, but listen, I absolutely regret anybody not being treated within the targets that we set. But let me just remind you of what was said by Jamie Hepburn that out of those 12,500 people, the vast majority were then treated within 16 weeks. Compare that to the year-long waits that happened under you. Can you confirm, Jenny Mara, that you will abandon the legal guarantee that patients have? Can you confirm what Dr Simpson said, Jenny that you will remove that legal guarantee? Jenny Mara. We would very much like to meet the law of this land as passed. But what should, presiding officer, what should... It has been referred to by Cabinet Secretary and the Minister as a target. It is not a target. This government put it into law and has a legal obligation to deliver it and has breached it. And these 12,500 people deserve at least an apology for that breach. <laughs> Presiding officer. I asked the Cabinet Secretary when she opened this debate this afternoon um, if she would publish weekly waiting times for accident and emergency departments across this country. And I was very surprised to hear her response because Shona Robinson abrogates responsibility to the Information Services Division who have advised her to publish this on a monthly basis. Now, Presiding Officer, she is the Cabinet Secretary. A political decision has been made in England and Wales to publish figures on a weekly basis. The Cabinet Secretary surely has the power, in the interests of patients across this country, that she override this rule and demand weekly published figures on A&E &E waiting times. Now, we understand that she is appraised on a daily basis on A&E waiting times. So why not publish this every week so patients can have the information that she is also privy to? And really, presiding officer, is the Cabinet Secretary telling me that she is prepared to break the law for 12,500 patients' right to treatment across the country, but she is not prepared to override advice from a quango saying that she can only publish figures every four weeks? Frankly, Presiding Officer, I think really you have to ask who exactly is in charge here. Presiding Officer... I think it's um, important. I'm very new to this job, as you know, and I was um, doing a bit of reading on a health check, a bit of a health check on our health boards across Order. the country. Presiding officer, you go from board to board, and bear with me, because this is really quite interesting reading. NHS Ayrshire and Arran, 137 breaches of the Scottish Government's treatment guarantee time. Audit Scotland report a staffing crisis. Half the maintenance of this board is due to be carried out as classed as high risk or significant risk. They were forced to postpone operations after 1.3 million of surgical equipment was stolen. And this month, some patients waited more than 12 hours for a bed. NHS borders, 250 breaches of the legal guarantee treatment time. Breached every month since you passed the law. Backlog of maintenance, over £6 million. NHS Fife, 354 breaches of the SNP law. Breached every month apart from one. The largest increase in Scotland of future maintenance costs over £13 million worth of work waiting to happen. The second worst vacancy rate in Scotland, the second worst record on cancer waiting times in the country, with one patient waiting five and a half months after diagnosis for treatment. Presiding Officer, NHS Highland, 1,475 breaches of the SNP law on the 12 week treatment time. In the last month, it was breached 143 times. They have £83 million of backlog in maintenance. NHS Lothian, 
6,760 breaches of the 12-week waiting time. In the last month alone, it was breached 420 times. One of the worst performing health boards in Scotland on waiting times and delayed discharge, spending on private health care has rocketed by 12%, nearly £2 million. I think, I think Cabinet Secretary of the Respect Chamber probably wants to hear this. A backlog of maintenance... A backlog of maintenance of £96 million. NHS Tayside 363 breaches of the SNP law breached every month. The Audit Scotland report said that NHS Tayside were relying on selling property to make ends eat make ends meet and less, met less than half of its targets on waiting times and delayed discharge. Presiding officer, I don't think this is a very good record in your first few weeks of, of office, Cabinet Secretary, for Alec Neil and for your predecessor. No, I've taken an intervention already. Presiding officer, presiding officer, we have committed to 1,000 extra nurses. In Order. Order. Presiding officer. Order. Presiding. Let's hear Miss Mara. Presiding officer. We have listened to staff across this country. The staff survey published just before Christmas. 75% of nurses in this country feel there are not enough of them to do the job. So Scottish Labour has committed to 1,000 extra nurses in in pressure points across our NHS, paid for by the mansion tax, tax avoidance measures. <laughs> Presiding officer, it's clear to me that the SNP benches do not agree with a mansion tax. So clearly... <laughs> Presiding officer. Order. Ms Mara, you've got Presiding about officer, 40 seconds. We heard this week that this SNP government has pressure in A&E departments across this country, it has a massive problem with delayed discharge across this country, but yet we hear that John Swinney has £440 million, £400, £440 million of an underspend. How much of this money will the Cabinet Secretary ask John Swinney for to spend? And why wasn't Alec Neil banging down his door to make sure that these pressures in the NHS did not build up? You need to close now. Presiding officer, I look forward to working on the health brief and working with the Cabinet Secretary to solve these problems. Thank you. That concludes the debate on Scotland's future. We now move to the next item of business, which is consideration of business motion 12048, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, setting out a revision to the business programme for Thursday, the 15th January 2015. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press the request to speak button now. And I call Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 12048. Moved. Thank you. No member is asked to speak against the, the motion, therefore I now put the question to the Chamber. The question is that motion number 12048, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next item of business is consideration of business motion number 12049, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, setting out a business programme. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press the request speak button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 12049. No members asked to speak against the motion. If I now put the question to the Chamber, the question is that motion number 12049, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next item of business is consideration of four Parliamentary Bureau motions. I would ask Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion numbers 12050 to 12053 on approval of SSIs. On block. Moved on block. The question on these motions will be put at decision time to which we now come. There are four questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is amendment number 12045.3 in the name of Shona Robeson, which seeks to amend motion number 12045 in the name of Richard Simpson on Scotland's future be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament's not agreed. We move to vote. Members should cast their votes now.
The result of the vote on amendment number 12045.3 in the name of Shona Robertson is as follows. Yes, 63. No, 39. There were 14 abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed to. The next question is that amendment number 12045.2 in the name of Jackson Carlaw, which seeks to amend motion number 12045 in the name of Richard Simpson on Scotland's future be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Parliament's not agreed. We move to vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 12045.2 in the name of Jackson Carlow is as follows. Yes, 14. No, 102. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The next question is that motion number 12045 in the name of Dr Richard Simpson as amended on Scotland's future be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament's not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion number 12045 in the name of Richard Simpson as amended is as follows. Yes, 63. No, 39. There were 13 abstentions. The motion as amended is therefore agreed to. I propose to ask a single question on motion numbers 12050 to 12053 on approval of SSIs. If any member objects a single question being put, please say so now. So the next question is on motions number 12050 to 12053 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on approval of SSIs be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motions are therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time. We now move to members' business. Members should leave the chamber, should do so quickly and quietly.